Hey there, and welcome to episode 66 of Killer POV. I'm your host, Rob G from Icons of Fright and Fearnet. Welcome back, Rebecca McKendry. Hello. I am so glad to be back. I missed you guys last week. We missed you last time because our other co-host was out of control. I heard things got really frisky. Alyssa was nuts. Alyssa (laughs) was out of control. I was fine. Yeah, Yeah, you think so. Hey, listeners, you'll never know (laughs) what really went on. I got emails about how body things got. And I also got a lot of emails from fans um, wishing me a speedy recovery. So thank you guys for that. That was very sweet. you're back already. Yes. Yes. Last is Elric Kane. Hello. The frisky one of the bunch. Apparently he's quite debonair when he uh, drinks a bit. Yeah. yeah that's right. <laughs> well, I told Rob I was going to be drinking that night. Yes. I gave him the heads up. He knew right. how it. And, and, and you know she's good we, people. She, she is. is. Most I people, told you that. You know, I even before we were intimate, hands. she was really oh, like, really here. friendly. Intimate. That's oh. not true. Get out of here. You'll never know. You do know that we're going to be outnumbered by women tonight. Yeah. Oh, yes, that's true. That's true. So, it's happening, guys. Yeah. I like Finally. that scenario. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a couple more beers I in like and I'll odds. be even better. Yeah. <laughs> I don't right. know about these ones. They can we're outdrink us. Yeah, we're all strong-minded horror women who can outdrink us and probably beat you up. And a girl from Belgium? Come on. Yeah. We're pretty intense, guys. Actually, Heidi will probably drive me to drink. So in a positive way, (laughs) in a positive way. So, all right. So Rebecca, why don't you start since you weren't here last time? I assume that you had time to watch a hell of a lot of stuff. Actually, I didn't. I mean, I was pretty damn sick, so I didn't get to uh, watch a lot. And um, and I do have to say, because um, uh, just giving you guys kind of a very brief uh, what I went through, I had some surgery done and they had done um, a spinal on me for the surgery. And uh, then it didn't heal properly. So I actually had a hole in my spine and was leaking fluid. And when you have this, you're not even allowed to sit upright to watch television. You can't even have a pillow. So for three days straight, I had to lay flat on my back and I couldn't even like see a television. You couldn't even like sit up to watch like Exorcist 2? (laughs) Spinal Tap movie. (laughs) We should have done a Spinal Tap movie in your honor. Well, I was thinking Pet Cemetery with the meningitis. Yes, that's spinal. Exorcist 2, I'm pretty sure she gets a spinal. And Devil's Backbone definitely would have fit in there. But no, I'm literally like staring up at the wall so I had my iPad and I could hold it up above my head but then my hands would get sore so I didn't get to watch a lot and honestly most of the time I wanted to sleep anyway Mm -hmm. but what I did get to watch um, I watched Lord of Illusions which I have not seen since like it first came out and um, when I first watched it I didn't really know as much about Clive Barker as I do now or kind of his mythos and the background of all of his stories and I have to say after seeing it that one I consider to be the most Barker-esque out of any of his films, mm-hmm. having seen it again. It's got a lot of like homoerotic fetishy overtones to it. It's got his kind of magical... Wait, 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 back up. Sorry. Barker's <laughs> gay? <laughs> I've Hold heard. my God. Phone. I've Eric. heard. Um, Hold the phone. But it's just got all of these um, overtones to it, and it, yet it incorporates magic and the occult and symbolism and creature. It was just kind of like his brain leaked out on screen. And mm-hmm. out of all of the things he's directed, I looked at that one and was like, "This is the most Barker." Wow, and that's that's the last thing he directed, mm-hmm. right? Uh, what, what just it happened? Uh, <laughs> one of our guests. Uh, I love that film. I, uh, you know, I, there's a couple of effect shots that I wish could be updated, mm-hmm. uh, you know, somehow, because it's kind of blocky and weird animat- animation kind of yeah. thing. But besides that, I really, I love the character. I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Barker fans, but I read the Damnation game first when I was young, and I'm pretty sure uh, the detective character also appears in the Damnation game. It's not an adaptation of that, but uh, what's his name? Har- Harry Belafonte? On Harry, yeah, so, something like that. Yeah, um, but I really like the character, and I think the world's great. I think the cult's great. I think those scenes are genuinely creepy. It reminded me of um, Bad Dreams, mm-hmm. similar kind of cult opening as Bad Dreams. But I, I, I just like that film. I, I agree, though. It's a, yeah, it is very Barker. Yeah, it's, it's great it's a score. Very peculiar you know? film. I can understand yeah. why it hasn't gotten quite as much acclaim as some of his other films because it's not as accessible, mm-hmm. and it's got just a lot of things that are just downright weird. Yeah. And that, that was explained. 90s, though, right? It came out in the 90s? Yeah, it was like I 95, like that, I want to say. That was like that dark period where horror wasn't as prominent. So mm-hmm. I know that yeah. one, for me, slipped between the cracks. Yeah. I don't think I've ever seen it. However, I am looking forward to revisiting now that Scream Factory will do it later this year. Yeah, that's why I was watching it. Oh, I was doing actually it? doing yeah. um, research for a piece that we're doing at Fangoria for the Scream Factory edition where mm-hmm. we're covering all their titles. So I went back and revisited it. And yeah, it's just, it's got a lot of weird stuff. A lot of things aren't explained mm-hmm. and they don't really need to be as long as you kind of get that that's Barker. Right. So I was totally psyched about that one. Um, Isn't I, the magician guy also in Deep Rising? 
Uh, yeah. yeah. So I figured you'd, like <laughs> you'd be a fan. You like my he Ghana is, poster I sent you? Actually, I love the magician guy and the guy from Deep Rising. Uh-huh. And um, I've actually looked into uh, what he's doing now. Hey. And I can no longer afford to use him in films because oh, he was in things like... Um, I can't even remember the name of it now, but he's done some pretty major stuff within the past couple of years that, you know, I just don't think I could afford him. He for reminds a film me of now. Hannibal from the original A-Team. Mm-hmm. Like his, he's always playing the kind of crazy mm-hmm. kooky character. Yeah. He's, he's always like the crazy shaky kind of, you know, yeah. paranoid schizophrenic character. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. He's, no, he's good. I liked it, him. And so. the character you mentioned that the main character mm-hmm. of, of Lord Illusions will appear again in Clive's upcoming book, Scarlet Gospels, along oh. with Pinhead. Oh, wow. Ooh. Yeah, he, he's been working on it for like 10 years and talking about it. And the last I read is he has delivered his final version of it. It's this epic, epic book called The Scarlet Gospels, and mm. it combines the characters from Lord of Illusions and Hellraiser. Oh, oh nice. yeah. So that's a good way. Yeah. Nice. Two yeah. cults going at it. Yeah, tied all together. Um, so then I also watched, um, <laughs> speaking of cool detective films, um, for a piece that I'm working on for Shock to Drop, I watched Cast a Deadly Spell again, mm. which I hadn't seen in a while. Have you guys seen this one? Cast a Deadly Never seen Spell. That one. Are you kidding me? No. Okay. I don't even know 1991. That. It's a made for HBO movie. And it is a, um, the premise is it's 1940. Wait a minute. Can we dial this back? That outrage of us not having seen it. And then you followed up with 91 <laughs> HBO. Oh, where the, okay, no. <laughs> where the hell was I on HBO? <laughs> it's the concept that sells it. Okay. It is 1948 Los Angeles, like right at the height of like the film noir detective stuff. But there's monsters and everyone uses magic. Hmm. So magic is used instead of weapons. And, you know, you use it in your everyday lives, but it's sold on the black market in more powerful forms. And the detective is Detective Lovecraft, and he's hunting down the Necronomicon for a client oh. because the Necronomicon holds the most powerful magic there is. Hmm. And um, and there's monsters, and it's a film noir. And Julian Moore plays the, like, damsel Hmm. in it so um it's fun and fred what do you ward, have it on what kind of fred format? ward is the detective yeah Love that Cop. makes sense um so yeah gruff rumpled yeah, suit yeah. he's beautiful in it so um yeah it's it never made it to dvd it stopped at vhs and hbo made a sequel to it called witch hunt which um was directed by paul schrader and had um dennis really? hopper as the lead oh um, yeah yeah i've seen the cover of that one yeah <laughs> i've never seen that though yeah. i like cast a deadly spell better and oh. it's got really good monsters and effects because it was all practical and yeah it's just a fun little film i highly Mm -hmm. recommend it so it's kind of if you don't like gangster films and you don't like horror films you won't like this but if you like those two genres it's kind of a beautiful why are you listening to the show um, (laughs) yeah if you're not into gangster films or like film noir then you probably won't dig this too much so did you um, do that purposely to double up with lord illusion like to look at i didn't actually unintentionally just unintentionally happened and then the last one that i watched i have a feeling you guys saw too um ryan turek and shock to you drop teamed up with can't talk about family. that before I talk about it. I can't You say watched it. it on some crappy uh, home video. I saw it on 35 millimeter. I, I got it from oh. Amazon Rental. So go ahead and uh, talk about fight. it so well, I can okay. add in. Okay. Well, I, well, I don't actually have much to say except for um, I was very tired. <laughs> <laughs> Midnights are not what they used to be. I will say that I think the effects on that film are about as exciting as any movie ever made. What are you talking about? Oh, the blob. The blue. Oh, there you go. From 1988. Chuck Russell. That's right. Yeah. Well, I assumed you were all there. <laughs> Did you uh, go to the midnight well, screening? No, I'm not. I'm not. I don't go to the. He's side. not superhuman. Oh, uh, see, I just I ordered <laughs> it off human. Amazon, and it was two bucks. But that's and I a DVD, it. right? No, it was a streaming rental. Oh, okay. I own the DVD. The Blu-ray mm-hmm. is coming soon from Twilight, Twilight. Time later mm-hmm. this year, and I will buy it. Yep, I've decided. But, um, you know, it still has its problem. Like Kevin Dillon, still the totally they cast the wrong Dillon. If Matt Dillon had been in that film, I would put it almost top 10 in terms of the fun that it could have been. <laughs> I don't know. But Kevin I think Dill- Kevin's kind of cool. Just, I it. think he's kind of atrocious, but but I knew that when I was a kid. I remember watching that film as a kid and going, who is this bozo? <laughs> and just like, and his hair. So, I think he's that it's bad. Like he's kinda, got a good mullet and a Billy yeah, Idol sneer going on. I mean, he's on fun. Like, he's fun. Don't get me wrong. He adds to the effect now. Um, Shawnee Smith's really cute in it. I thought she's yeah. really But just the effects and, and the, the world of it is interesting because I... I, I guess I didn't know that Darabont co-wrote it mm-hmm. with Chuck Russell mm-hmm. and it shows so much now yeah. that cause it literally looks like it's set in a Stephen King town. Yeah. It feels like it's a main, even though it's Louisiana for yeah. in real life. Uh, you know, I just, I think the film itself has certain like dramatic flaws. It's fun, but the, any scene where something's happening with the blob without it, as long as it's not like a rotoscope or a rear screen projection, those scenes are a little, you know, they've aged poorly, but the actual scenes where people are covered in slime are so good. They're so good. And it looks yeah. like there's veins and it looks, just alive when the guy gets pulled yeah, people get bent okay. in half there's a, one this. moment my eyes were half closing 
and it got to the part where the guy's head is pulled into a tiny little um, drain. 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 Yeah. And my eyes, literally, like from another Chuck Russell film, The Mask, where it goes, <laughs> ooga, and his eyes get big. I literally did one of those because I was like, I have no idea how you just did that. It felt like a magic trick because I didn't see a cut. Yeah. I just saw a guy go with his head aiming towards it, and it just kind of got sucked perfectly in. So the effects, I think, are just, it's exciting to yeah. see something that was pulled off with so many different effects from mechanical to, you know, just makeup blob type stuff. Uh, you know, I honestly wouldn't have a clue how they did it. What yeah. I didn't notice before I rewatched it, um, I rewatched it with my husband who had never seen mm. the 1988 version before. And he pointed out to me how thing like the blob is mm -hmm. in it. And mm -hmm. it's not like that in the original, but in this 1988 version, um, it's got tentacles and it transforms bit, yeah. and um, it creeps through things. And it, yeah, it's much more of a thing feel, but it yeah, works. It pulls them in. Yeah, it I think it definitely is of the time. Yeah. yeah. Well, but, that's, that's but, the way you update it. You know, yeah, you can't exactly. exactly the same but i remember when it came out that was the thing they were saying oh it's faster it's got tentacles it, it's able to do stuff that and we didn't we see did the original it. it's not from outer space anymore it was germ germ oh, that's right yeah, right. yeah i like and that. i do think it, it, it's not one of those holy grails i think this one absolutely should be remade but if you remade it i would love them to keep the effects exactly mm -hmm. as it is like to even like that should be the reference try to even hire tony gardner who did it mm -hmm. get the people who created that because i think that part's basically perfect i think the story you could do something a lot more interesting now mm -hmm. right you know the small town story has been done it's uh slither you know it's been yeah, done yeah. more recently to almost the same thing um but yeah it's fun i but love the scene um effects wise where she's in the um the phone booth mm -hmm. and oh, she's yeah. like trying to get in touch with the cop and she's the, the operator says mm -hmm. like he's at the diner there and, and then like, you see you his see like half decomposed face slide across right. and, uh, and chuck russell was at the screening and he was explaining how the phone booth thing there's a shot from above and it's just all miniatures. And he said it was just a mi like he's most proud of some of the miniature stuff they pulled off and incorporated where you couldn't tell. I mean, I was sitting there watching a movie. I had no idea if it was a miniature or not, but it was it's pretty awesome. And he seemed like a really fun guy. He, he didn't seem to know much about the resurgence of interest in it. And wow. he didn't even know it was coming out on Twilight Time. Like wow, when Ryan right, Turk yeah. said, yeah, I'm going to, they want me to do an interview or something with you. He's like, I didn't even know it was coming out. That's awesome. You know, so <laughs> it was kind yeah. of, you know, but he seemed like, you know, he was enjoying how much people really responded to and had fun with it. It, it actually is a perfect midnight movie, I would say. Mm -hmm. I just, I'm not cut out for midnights anymore. <laughs> yeah. I can't do it. Yeah, it's tough. But it, but it was a lot of fun. I'm asleep. Yeah. Did, right. uh, did you, so you, you give Kevin Dillon's hair a pass, really? <laughs> I gave it a pass on that. See, when I was a kid, I used to think he was cute in that. Uh -huh. um, and I definitely, he was not the cutest Dylan, but um, he was cute in that. Richard Grieco was uh, Ryan Terry, uh, uh, Kurt, uh, Chuck Russell said that uh, he was the other person who was thought of for the role. Who was? If Looks Good Kill, Ryan, uh, Richard Grieco. Richard oh, Grieco. yeah, yeah. Booker. Yeah, he came very close. 21, 21 Jump, Jump Street, Street, maybe. Yep, came very yeah. close. What else did you see? Oh, me? Yeah. Uh, I saw a Ghost in the Machine on Mike Williamson. Uh, 16 millimeter. It's that 93 film in the vein of Lawnmower Man. And I mean, really in the vein of Lawnmower Man. Almost <laughs> exactly the same film. Uh, Johnny Mnemonic, Brain Scan. Brain Scan, I think, is the only one I give a pass of those movies because it's kind of fun and the killer is kind of fun. Those movies are fucking horrendous. Like, it's almost like the dark part of our history that we need to somehow <laughs> exile because the special effects, it's like you're making a whole movie to be cutting edge about technology and then that's the part that's so freaking terrible. Right. It really was pretty painful and the worst part was uh, for a few minutes before Mike strung up a black and white print of Night of Living Dead just to show us a print. Mm -hmm. And like my jaw was dropping. I felt like I'd never seen the movie before because it, seeing it so big, there was yeah. all this detail. And he's like, all right, but now we're going to watch this. He puts it on. I'm like, oh my God, this movie's... And he loves it, doesn't he? I guess so. Yeah, of course. <laughs> he, like, he, it'll be on the next debate. It's about an address book killer who's on his way to kill a family. He looks in the address and he goes off the road and dies while there's a power surge. And then suddenly... There's he's, a ghost in the yeah, machine. Yeah, suddenly he is like, his spirit is projected as into this machine and starts killing people through thing. And there's a couple cool deaths. But man, is it, it is a bit of a chore, but mm -hmm. you know, it's always fun with company watching this, but there, there is, there's this whole group of those techno movies that are really just bad. The net. Wow. If you go back oh, and net. watch yeah, the, the net bad. now, it's just hilarious <laughs> where she's like, I'm uploading to the mainframe and it's like oh, yeah. really slow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just watching a yeah. slug go on. And then uh, one we can b all both talk about from last night, uh, Scream Factory is releasing their giant Canadian killer rat movie, Deadly Eyes. Yeah, yeah, which I'd never heard of. I'd never even heard of it. Until they announced it. Yeah. And it was a lot of fun. It was, you know, I'm not a big, I wouldn't say I'm a big uh, animal attack person in general. I think there's some great ones like alligator and stuff. Yeah. But in general, I think, and when they're rats or like little insects, I usually find them kind of like, eh, like Night of Lepus is so ridiculous yeah. with, the, with the rabbits. I think it's supposed to be. It's fun. Yeah, it's fun. Well, I don't know if it's, you watch some of those and they so, they're not funny. 
So you wonder if they were made like straight. Right, right. This one's definitely made kind of straight. It's it's a very awkward structure film because it's got these teens that open the movie and then they just disappear for half the movie. Yeah. In the middle half of the film, it goes to an adult story. I, I got to tell you, I kind of loved it. Yeah, I've never no, it seen it before. I, I love the movie. I'd never seen it before. And the fact that they constantly shift who the main character mm-hmm. is, at least I wasn't bored the whole time. Cause it I'm really like, is. I was shocked that Ryan didn't like Ryan posted that this was a, a total woof of a movie. Like, oh, it's terrible. Crazy. And I was like, that's, it was really entertaining. It was entertaining. It kept uh, shifting gears. And honestly, I love if you're going to like, if they do this now, it's going to all be CG, but I love that they had the audacity to just dress up oh, a bunch yeah. of little dogs. And, yeah. make and I couldn't tell. Dachshunds? Is I that think it? So. I think they're dachshunds dressed, uh, dressed in a couple times. I could see apparently you can tell more from the Blu-ray. Uh-huh. Because we're watching a film print, so it has that nice kind of murky feel anyway. Uh, but people sit on the Blu-ray, it's so high def that you could actually see the outlines. But they, I found it much more convincing because they're, they're, they're big. They're and big so when and they're, they're attacking moving. Scatman Crothers, who's dying and being, you're like, oh, man, bummer, Scatman. Oh, I Who want also, to be attacked <laughs> by a horde of dachshunds. It's like the cutest had, death ever. He had the greatest title card over his, oh, yeah, over his face during it. And a lot of scenes where he's in a snowplow and it literally, you could intercut it into The Shining and it would make sense. <laughs> it's just him on a snowplow. And I'm like, it's <laughs> footage that came. But uh, I will say it had, even if there was nothing else good in this movie, it felt like it was all leading up to this movie theater scene. Oh, yeah. And, the movie, and I am a sucker for a good horror movie movie theater scene. Right. There's like, we should just one day do a whole episode yeah, on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, from Demons Onward. But that was awesome. Yeah. Like, it's just a full on attack. And the, the and director, really I, I looked it up after because they're showing a Bruce Lee movie or whatever. That's right, the Game director, of Death, yeah. yeah, the director directed a bunch of Bruce Lee movies, including oh. Enter the Dragon, which is why oh, wow. he's able to get those. It was um, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar fighting him. Yeah. That was pretty cool. <laughs> but you have to mention that uh, at this at this screening, uh, one of the lead actresses, uh, Lisa Lang Lois, yeah, was there. And uh, Mike Williamson did a Q&A with her, which killed. It yeah, was, was so really funny. Fun. He got up and right off the bat, he's like, I just got to know, what did these dogs think about like other dogs? Because they're like looking over and seeing dogs with like rat masks. <laughs> I love that he's asking her what the <laughs> dogs thought. He's like, I'm yeah. a dog. I don't understand what's happening. Yeah. And then he was, and then he followed that question up with uh, a lot of, a lot of nipple sucking in this movie, <laughs> which it wasn't her nipples, unfortunately, because yeah, yeah, she was yeah. dropped in gorgeous. Even now, she was also in class of 1984. Class of 1984. Uh, happy birthday happy to me. Happy birthday to me. And Cur- so I think somebody saw Curtains, wasn't it? Was she not in Curtains? Uh, I don't know about maybe Curtains. Maybe not. Maybe a lot of good slashes. Oh, those Canadian sad. films yeah. where they shot there, and, and she was in two Claude Chabrol films, the that French kind of thriller Hitchcockian. Let me director. Um, was, she was good. She, she was really fun. But the film is actually, you know, I love these ones that, like Final Exam, which I didn't personally care for, yeah. but, and some people won't care for this one. Right. But we did. I think this is the this is kind of the gold part. I think of what Scream Factory and anyone's doing. They're releasing things that we might have missed or fallen through the cracks. Mm-hmm. So right. I, I think people it. get a kick out of this one. All I have to say is early on. Children and the elderly oh, are not safe. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's really interesting because, you know, you yeah, don't Je- see... Jeff, Jeff Nelson looked at me and I was like, they're hitting my wish list right off the bat. Yeah. <laughs> Babies the usually like. survive these films. <laughs> and when, when a baby goes, anything can Ooh, follow. Ooh, a baby That's all went. We're saying. Hey, it's a hardcore film. Saying. And the elderly. And yeah. the elderly. <laughs> yeah. Nothing was safe in that movie. Um, Anything else? Uh, only a fact that uh, this is only for the nerds who like when I talk about uh, possession. But uh, <laughs> oh, a, friend, a, a friend of mine wrote to me and told me that Zulowski, the director, yes. wrote a draft of the Dead Zone that never got Whoa. made. Are you serious? Yeah, and I don't know if and, wow. and I don't know if it was for uh, Cronenberg or if it was like before he was attached. But now I'm like, if anyone knows anything of how I could read this thing. I would love to read it. Yes. Wow. A friend of mine wrote to me. It was in the Cronenberg on Cronenberg book, which is amazing. I read it years ago. It's one of the best. Um, so I'm I have that. I haven't read it all. It's though. really yeah. good. That's, that's really one of the best. Lynch on Lynch is really good. Cronenberg, Cronenberg's almost better. It's just a great, you know, he's such an articulate guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, I, s- I saw two quick things that I'll mention. Um, Blue Sunshine, which Rebecca lent to me, yeah. uh, only because it's one of the few Jeff Lieberman movies that I've never mm-hmm. seen before. And, uh, you know, we saw Remote Control a few weeks ago, and he just his, he's kind of just been you know, around and, I, and I it's not really it. horror, right? It's more like a it's, exploitation. Yeah. It's like, it falls into the drug exploitation, yeah, yeah. but it's definitely post hippie exploitation as well. There's a lot of exploitation yeah. involved there, but I consider it horror just because it does have kind of like a slasher angle. Cause there's a serial killer that's going around. I don't of. That's, that's not what it, no, yeah. it's, it's, um, it's been a long time. Here's the thing. I, I it's, I'm not going to say I didn't like it, but I was definitely, when I watched it, I was pretty disappointed because mm. 
the cover art is really great. The poster mm-hmm. art, the title. Yeah. And for some reason, I was expecting like a brain damage Frank Henenlotter oh, style. Oh, weird. It's much more of like a crime drama. Right. With like weird stuff going on. And more than anything, it's kind of a low budget like like crime mystery yeah. because right. there's people that are just going bald and killing people. Yeah. And Wait, it, wait. You need more than that? <laughs> no, <I laughs> mean, to me, that's perfection. That's, that's fun. That's fun and interesting. But it's, it's I guess, and I mean, if you really look at the cover, it's a, it's a bald lady who mm-hmm. plays into the story. But... It just wasn't what I expected. Now, when I think of it, you know, after that I've seen it, it's, I do kind of like, Lieberman always latches onto an idea Mm -hmm. and and he always has an interesting idea as at the center of all his films. And this one is, you know, all those people doing LSD, you know, in the sixties, what if, you know, 10 years after they took a specific kind, it made them psychos. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of what the whole thing is. It felt actually a little dead zone-ish too. I'm mentoring candidate. A, it took yeah, a little a bit whole, of that. Yeah. There's that. There's a political angle too mm-hmm. and stuff. Um, but uh, yeah. Yeah, maybe you'll like it more uh, later on because of that, because of... Well, the, yeah, now that I know what it is. Up, but again, yeah. I was expecting like weird visuals yeah, yeah. and crazy, you know, kind I think of stuff. I, I think mm-hmm. I expected the same thing when I saw it years ago. I think uh, I had that same same reaction actually. See, I gotta say, Solomon King is, is a lead Oh, that's right. That's right. Is the weirdest thing ever. He just seems very intense the whole time and yeah. I, I i'm like i don't know but i highly recommend his red shoes <laughs> well, well yeah i saw blue sunshine way too young because my parents used to have the vhs when i was like a little kid and mm-hmm. i remember seeing them watching it and being like kind of like oh it's a weird movie but then when i finally saw it i was bored by it mm-hmm. and it wasn't until like 20 years later that i had appreciation for yeah, it there's something about it that isn't yeah good. it's the soundtrack i never i remember you got the vinyl was it interesting no I, I didn't pick up the vinyl i picked oh. up the visitor vinyl but the soundtrack right. was in the uh, set she gave uh-huh. she lent me Huh. So yeah, it's it's I a good, good it. soundtrack. Yeah. Uh, and uh, lastly, um, I meant to do this weeks ago, but Friday uh, because it's summertime, I, I tend to revisit the Friday the Thirteenth movies. So I went back to the original. Now that I have them all mm-hmm. on Blu-ray, and it sucks because it actually I didn't realize it takes place on the first movie takes place on June Friday the Thirteenth, mm-hmm. and we had a yeah. June Friday the Thirteenth like two weeks ago. So I totally missed out on that. Um, but you know what? It's interesting because of all those movies, I don't remember the first. Well, I remember two pretty well, but I definitely don't remember one like at all. Like every time I put it on, I'm always surprised because I remember the end. I remember the showdown at the end mm-hmm. and kind of Jason's appearance. And but I'm more Kevin familiar. Bacon, right? Yeah, of course. Kevin yeah. Bacon. Yeah. But but, you know, like I f- didn't realize that he's only in about the first 40 minutes yeah. of the movie, you know, watching it this time. Um, but I don't know. It's interesting. It's fun. It's it's well made from Sean Cunningham. It's way too long. <laughs> like once you hit the halfway point where characters start getting bumped off. There's just so much padding in that movie. And I just, I started watching it and fast forward. Wow. I mean, Adrian King actually boils a cup of tea and we watch it for three minutes. We is watch her boil. Is there a driving boil. sequence? A what? A driving well, the girl, sequence? Uh, I Annie, is it? The, the girl at the start is hitchhiking and well, she gets in the, the car beginning. with the guy. Okay. Yeah. And then, yeah, there's, so there's, there's, you know, in the second half, there's a lot of padding in there, but you know what? It doesn't matter. It, you know, it, if you start a movie strong and you can end a movie strong, you could kind of get away with anything you, you want in between. Some tea in the middle. You can make you can make tea for three minutes. Is that the one the where they're ending, trying to kill a rat with a machete and they're all in the? It's all, a it's a snake. A snake. I remember yeah, that yeah. scene being really like rat. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a long scene, but you know what? The the last I don't know fifteen minutes, the showdown and yeah. the way the whole setup is is still so effective and great that it, it's worth it. Oh yeah, yeah, but, definitely. Uh, but yeah, I tell you, it's one of those weird franchises where if you ask people, what's your favorite? Like most people would say, well, the first is the best and the rest just are, you know, not as good. That's the only franchise where I never hear anyone say the first one is their favorite. I don't think I've never. seen the first since like high school. I really, but I mean, like I have vivid memories of like three and seven and things yeah. like that. I saw it with Betsy. Pick my favorite. That's Betsy Palmer. Right? Betsy yeah. Palmer's in, yeah. I saw it in Chicago at the music and she was there like maybe just before I moved here. So it was like four years ago and I remember her like bouncing up the steps and she it was really fun. It was yeah. like, she yeah. seemed, she's awesome. She seemed to really like now. Now that it was something whereas yeah. back then she was like slumming it like yeah. big time she was like really they want me to do this thing like yes. i guess she was like a soap star or something yeah, she, i like, mean she had a movie career yeah. and, and did like game show stuff too yeah, yeah but yeah. It, it was a fun way to see that film yeah but it, no it's yeah i think i think i have read some people say that like when they do top tens but again i i don't know if i believe it yeah because that then you're competing film? with yeah. just all slasher films rather than uh, which is the best jason film right yeah yeah, yeah. i've okay. also met who's the guy who plays jason the first one? he just comes out at the end oh, Ari Lehman. Yeah, Ari, yeah. he so the video store i worked in chicago he would come in all the time <laughs> and the first time he came in i had no idea he was the kid right oh, he he tell you know. yeah first, first line out of his mouth is hey just so you know i was the kid from wow <laughs> so i guess he's chicago based his band but, first jason oh really yeah. first jason yeah <laughs> but that is many a fango convention like yes. if you watch I it <laughs> 
<laughs> without the context of this old movie's ending like that, you know, since Carrie. Yeah. It's and it was a Carrie freaking, knockoff. Yeah, sure. but it's so great. Yeah, like, it is. It's just one of the best moments in horror films. And and that's not just because of the surprise. I think it's largely because of the cinematography. It just has this beautiful... The music, too. Yeah, the music it has this just mm. beautiful quality to in the trees. The serene lake. Yeah, the, everything about it. And the film <laughs> stock, all these things that would be very hard to replicate that look now, I think, with, uh, yeah. with digital. You know, there's just so much in that scene. And I the, love that scene. The only thing Blu-ray is not kind on those movies mm. is Savini's effects. Yes. Oh, interesting. It, Which I really saw that good. problem in the burning. It's yeah, a little... you can really see uh, <laughs> the seams, especially uh. the Kevin Bacon one. Like, wow, really? Because that's yeah. one of those ones. Yeah, it, it, next time you come over, I'll just show you that I guess scene you're right, because VHS does, is so murky that I guess it really helped. Yeah, but I mean, plus, that, so. also, when you're seeing it on the big screen, like, you know, video wasn't a big thing. Mm-hmm. You're expecting to see something for three seconds mm-hmm. right. and uh, hoping the audience doesn't catch on. But now we yeah. under the scrutiny. Right. You know? Yeah. Interesting. But, well, uh, you yeah. inspired me. I'm going to go back and rewatch the first one. You should. Week. It's interesting. Catch up for the summer. Uh, all right. So let's go grab our guests and some more beer. Yes. And we shall be back. And welcome back, everyone. We are here with two absolutely amazing females who I am absolutely honored to work with. Oh, yeah. And Elric and Rob are still here, too. Hey, we're outnumbered. So I uh, like it. This might get exciting. Yeah, it's going to get exciting. So we have Heidi. Do you, wait, Martin Uzi? Honeycut? Let's go I with Honeycut. Care. I don't even know which last <laughs> name you go by. I know. Right now, I'm going, I'm going by Honeycut just because... Um, my ex-husband gets really mad when I use Martin Uzi, which is my ex-husband's last name. Ooh. No. Yeah. Yeah. I used to just use Martin Uzi, but then we got a divorce and then uh, he got really upset that I was still using it because he had a new girlfriend who was really upset that both his ex-wives were still using his last <laughs> name. And so I guess she gave him some shit or something. You I should don't really write know. a book under that name. Is Honeycut yeah, your maiden name? Honeycut is is actually a completely fabricated name. From mash? Pulled out it of from my, mash? It's right, I pulled it out of my Did ass. Did you pull that out of your mash? Yes, <laughs> okay, I pulled. Right. I just I pulled it out of my butt. Like, oh. hey, you know what? I'll I'm gonna use this because honestly, I have a maiden name, and I have a married name, and I don't. My parents are really strict weirdos from the old country, and they don't understand anything that I've ever done. And I'll, and I'll, I've been <laughs> yeah. in like a lot of movies with my top ops and mm-hmm. stuff like that, and they just. They can't see that stuff because they will have a heart attack and die. You did something crazy then. I remember the last time I interviewed you on Inside R, you were telling me about a crazy vagina in a box movie for... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Right. yeah. I can't remember. Was it in a box or what was it? Oh, that was the title of it was Box. Oh. It's on. It's like online. Like yeah. you can so just go wait, find wait, wait. it on pause Vimeo. The, pause the interview. <laughs> There's like <And> as you <laughs> listen, <laughs> it's a drinking game. There's like no... Like I have lost like every every possible speck of mystery I could ever have had, like just throughout the last decade, it's just like gone. Like <laughs> there's so I haven't seen this movie. So I I haven't it's basically full honesty. I it's, it's um a short film that I made with a friend um, named Nikki wall. And it's basically just me uh, pretending to be a mom to her real life daughter um, who was in the film. And it's sort of like a weird series of images. There's not like a really strong narrative or anything, but part of what happens is I get completely naked and get in a bathtub and give myself an abortion with a coat hanger. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Okay. This is a short. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You can Google it. It's called Box, Awkward. directed by Nikki Wall. <laughs> we, we have Axel Awkward Carroll in here, too. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. So, oh. Hey, Axel, how are you? I'm good. <laughs> have you, have you ever been in a scene like that? <laughs> No, she's been in real movies. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, just, just so you know, you have to get close into this thing. Sure. Yeah. It's yeah. Like, kind of how like... they do it in Belgium. <laughs> <laughs> Which you were just in a Belgium doing interviews. I saw, I've seen like videos or photos of things that I don't think they're videos, but of you doing interviews yeah, no, for I've film. Yeah, I've done TV interviews there. It was exciting. Yeah, that's oh. cool. It was weird. And your film is called Soulmate. Mm-hmm. And it's going to be playing, premiering, a North American premiering at Etheria. Yes. Yes. Which is kind of an offshoot, but not the same as Viscera, which... It's the same idea, Mm -hmm. different festival. By some of the same people. Yeah, yeah, some of the same people, myself included. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's expanded to um, not just horror, which is what Viscera was, but now we do science fiction, fantasy, thrillers, action, um, and we're showing fewer films, and there's, you know, that's pretty much the only difference. Um, But, yeah, we wanted to show a feature, and... um, Axel's film is is absolutely amazing, and we're really honored to be screening it. Like, really, we're and pumped. Halloween Kid, one of your shorts had played there two years previously, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, both before. short films played it. Okay, I've only yeah, seen yeah, Halloween Kid, but that's a lot of fun. It's got a really nice atmosphere piece. Oh mm-hmm. yeah, it's really it's really cool. And her her films are neat because they don't they have a lot of horror elements. 
but they don't fall under one genre. Like it's really hard to like put them in a box. Mm -hmm. If we were, I don't know where I came up with the word box after our, this last conversation. Um, but yeah, it's like there's there's some fantasy. There's a little bit of like gothic romance, mm -hmm. um, a little bit of thriller. Um, yeah, I was, tr I was trying to describe a little bit of horror. It's, it's got um, a bunch of different stuff in it. Yeah, I was trying to describe Soulmate to them because I I saw it with Heidi actually, um, and. It's like this thing that you do is you kind of, your setup is always a horror movie. Like you're following it, like, all right, mm -hmm. I think I know where this is going. And then there's always kind of a, like a little left turn where it's like, mm -hmm. all right, we're not really in genre territory. We're we're playing with some of those themes and what you'd expect from it. But then it kind of, you know, like, you know, the reason we picked the topic that we did, which is, what is it, like romance in, in movies? Yeah. Got, yeah. Which, which I yelled which, at them at first. As soon as we walked in, Rebecca's like, oh, we, we have girls on the show, so we have to do romance. I know, when right? they told me the topic, I was like, seriously, guys, this is the first time I have like fellow female filmmakers on, aside from Zan Cassavetes. Yeah. But otherwise, yeah. we have had no females yeah, on the show. Actress. Well, actresses. We've had, we've had a few actresses, but Daniel none Harris. Daniel Harris is a director, too. Come okay, on. okay. Had a few. A few. A very, I'll say, a, a It is few. way underrepresented. It is way. I mean, it's like yeah. five percent of the guests we've had have been don't female. listen to last week's episode but no. yeah <laughs> except for last week where elric gets all like i treated her very frisky. <laughs> i just drank but um, i told them i was like so we finally get females on and you're making us talk about love stories guys but not and, and, I and, yeah. That's we're, the, we're not only talking about love stories we're talking about a film festival <laughs> that shows women's films so it's all very like we want to make we want to get everything that you guys have been missing all in one episode we're tokens yeah yes yeah and it's it's one of those weird things that my film, like you said, is not it's not one genre, it's not mm -hmm. one specific thing. You can you can tag it on, um, but it starts as a ghost story and then it turns into something else. And a lot of people have said, well, it's very romantic. It's a romance. There's a love story going on between the two characters. I'm like, no, it looks like it. But if you've seen the film, mm -hmm. it's not. There's a relationship that's happening, but it's not a love story. And I've had the, the interview I did in Belgium with that the, the TV mm. guys. They kept going, so it's really a love story, right? And I'm like, no, let me explain. And they explain it. And they go, so going back to the love aspect of the <laughs> film. And like, oh. they, they said that three times. Weird. So I, I, wanna, I do want to talk about the love element of the film. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I assume it's a love story because you're a woman director. So I want to <laughs> exactly. tie it together. Um, Heidi, back me up. Yeah. Uh, but no, I mean, uh, well, that, had they seen the movie? These guys? Yeah, yeah. No, that's it's, just idiot. Have it's you ever really asked more, somebody, is it really a love story? It's that's really more stupid. of like a love story, like rom like romantic comedy, uh -huh. really, yeah. more than it is <laughs> just a straight love story. You know? right. and it's really about like a 30-something woman, sort of, you know, she writes a column. Oh, you God, know, stop. People are going to buy that. <laughs> no one's coming now. Everyone just sold it. And that's going to play in the daytime, and then you at night it goes back to kind of more of a traditional format of the short. Yeah, they go the, to horror in the evening. Yeah, yeah. The so love showing, stories in so the we're showing Axel's yeah. film. I'll be there for both. I'm um, at 4 p.m. <laughs> at the Egyptian Theater. Uh -huh. and then July 12th. At, uh, yes. Yes. Did Saturday. you hear about the woman who got her lost her finger there? No. On where? my way here... <laughs> And I love the Egyptian. I love Grand Moniker. If you're listening, <laughs> no, this my is God. really weird. On my way here, literally on my way here in the car, NPR says a woman is suing for a huge amount. Egyptian theater. She's a con ma major conductor in LA. Ooh. Lost her finger in the bathroom because of negligence of their bathrooms. I need and to go into that bathroom and okay. lose yes. my finger. Yes. So like she's, ASAP. She's suing for a huge amount. And I was like, oh my God. This I have is been in cool. that bathroom so many times. Yeah. I want to know what's negligent about the bathroom. I don't bathroom. know. The door, I think it got uh, severed oh, in, the, in, in the door, door. or something. Oh, and, uh, oh yes, when we that see door. Him, the door. You totally called it. That <laughs> bathroom door like doesn't stay open. It closes. Oh, like so you, you open did. it and it just like moves itself closed. I bet you anything her finger got caught in the door. Yeah, I don't know. But it was just really surprising to even hear a story about the Egyptian theater on my way here. I was like, oh, sad. Wow, this wow. is not their week. They're also having a problem with their ticket sales, but like on the... Oh, really? But yeah, but that's totally taking backseat to this. Let's I also say, like, you know? It's a hundred year old theater. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, you have to give breaks to these historic landmarks. You know, they, they and they have a lot of them. I mean, Spielberg, a lot of those people put money into that woman, place, like, right? got her finger cut off, and then she was like, oh, sweet. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I going to be so rich. So and then just yeah. went to the Egyptian. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Terrible. That's yeah, the anyway. ticket. So Seriously. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, you know, why don't we go back a little bit? Because, uh, you know, um, what a lot of people might not know is that both Heidi and Axel uh, kind of come from the same world that we do, which I, I guess 
journalism, if you will, horror right. entertainment yeah, yeah, yeah. journalism. Yeah, Axel Fangoria. Wrote it. There Fangoria were quotations around, around that well, when he I, said that. No, no, they were necessary. I, 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 <laughs> I'm, a foe, I'm foe for sure. I, I, don't, yeah, I don't, I don't, mean, I don't mean it about. as I'm insulting your credibility as as those. It's just me, myself. I'm almost like, I'm not really a journalist. I, I don't have a journalism degree. No, no, so I don't, I don't have any credibility no, either. Okay, what are you talking great. about? <laughs> but we've written and convinced people to pay us to write stuff yes, yes. about movies. And you both work for Fangoria or have in past. Axel started out with Fango, if I remember correctly. Oh, uh, started out with Creature Corner. Cre- oh, Creature. Wow. remember that. Yeah. Whatever nice. happened, what happened to Creature Corner? Is it it still there? turned into Dread Central, yeah. didn't it? Yeah. 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 No, but it was still around after Dread Central, just all the people from Oh, but Dread it wasn't Central the same left. people. So but it was I like if know. you still went to CreatureCorner.com, it was still there. Yeah, he was at Creature Corner. Uh, yeah, he was there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. God, this is like Ryan started at Fango. We were yeah, his first like right. horror. Yeah. Well, Ryan's the one who gave me my first interview. He was like, um, he, I was going to this festival in Brussels, and I mentioned it to him because I was on the message boards for Creature Corner, and he said, "Well, Stuart Gordon's going to be there. Can you go and interview him?" And that's how I started wow. out. Wow. How Ryan. ironic that all these years later, he's the one to shut you out of horror trivia. It's <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, you're just—it's a cold, cold life. It must have been. Yeah. Uh, so, then, yeah, yeah, so, and then, and Heidi, where did you start? I don't even know this for sure. Oh my God, I started. Where did you start, Heidi? I started <laughs> writing for Bloody Disgusting. Oh, back wow. in like, back in like 2003 or something like that to date myself. Yeah. Wow. Um, days. Yeah, Brad was, was one of the very first people in this whole thing that I met. Was he here um, physically or was he in LA? Uh, he wasn't, Chicago. he was in Chicago was still. Chicago. Yeah. And uh, I think it was like a year or two later that he moved to LA. Um, but yeah, I was just like a huge horror fan. I, I wanted to do stuff and I was hanging out on the bloody disgusting forums and stuff like that. And were you an actress as well? Or is that saying you got into, no, that sort of happened after because it was like, I started going to interview people and do stuff for bloody disgusting. And they, uh, you know, I would go to a convention and just get really drunk and there would be like dudes there and then they'd be like, you should be in my movie. And I'd be like, hee hee. And I would be in their movie, and then I'd take my top off, and then I'd wake up the next morning and go, oh my God, I'm famous. <laughs> you know, and then... You know. And you should probably help people for, like, uh, who are looking on YouTube right now. After that, it's Martinuzzi or Honeycutt. Oh, yeah. Have a, have, I mean, seriously, like, like, like have a ball. Yeah. I'm just going to Google boobs right now. Yeah. It comes a up. generic Heidi's boobs Google. Boobs. Heidi boobs. You know... We've already devolved into that. That's sad. That's sad. We've honestly, had such high if, hopes for if that's the day. only thing, if that's really the, my biggest regret in life, then I'm totally cool with that okay. because it's like, fuck it. You know, I'm going to be 90 one day and, like, no one's going to want to ever fuck me again. And I can just, like, Tell them to go Google, you know, whatever slaughter party, and they can jack off to it, and I'll feel better. Party. That's the saddest thing I've heard all day. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm depressing her now. Um, Just drink. Mom. I usually try to restrain myself. I usually try to like, re- you know, filter myself a little bit around Axel because I don't want to scare her completely. But right now, I'm not doing it. I'm Did, sorry. Yeah, I'm such guess, a delicate flower. No, you're I know. not. But you know, I don't. I'm like. I like Heidi unfiltered. You X, should, yeah, she's I think those Fearnet uh, commentaries are still live, and I I enjoyed putting notes to those. <laughs> <laughs> With Jill Kill, right? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. For what, what the movie Stendhal Syndrome? Stendhal which, Syndrome and Uncle Sam. The, yes. Wow. Very, very brave on both movies. <laughs> I was like, when they sent that out, and they were like, "Who wants to do?" And I was like, "Oh, I'll do Uncle Sam." And they were like, "Great." I think it was Jacqueline. Yeah. She was like, "Really? Yeah. <laughs> no one else wants to do." And I'm like, "Uncle Sam, are you kidding? It's such a good movie." And she was like. You've seen it? <laughs> <laughs> it's a movie. Yeah. yeah. It's something else. Uh, Axel, did you start? So when you were doing that, were you in Belgium or in America? Yeah, I was in, okay. uh, actually I was in London. Okay. And it, yeah. did Belgium have a horror scene? Like, I guess I know a couple contemporary directors from there, but did, were there people? Not like, really. No. There's just uh, Fabrice Duwes, the guy uh-huh. who did The Ordeal. Is pretty much the only one I can think of. Oh, I, I thought, love that movie, though. It's good, it's but Calvary. it's the only one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. That's the one I said, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's that's kind of the only mm. one I can think of. But There's a, a a trauma movie called Rabid Grannies, which right, yeah. I think oh, is yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Men Bites that. Dog, obviously. Oh, right, yeah. right. Very very Calvary, like it, it always gets lumped into like French extreme yeah, cinema. It, it does, doesn't yeah. really get separated out, which is a shame. Yeah, and it's yeah. kind of insulting. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Way to oh. go, Becca. I didn't say I was <laughs> doing that. I just said it gets lumped in. It does. Yeah. But so what were the, some of the things that kind of sparked? Did you always know you wanted to make films or were you just uh, started as a fan or? Um, no, I was a fan. I, I, I've loved horror movies as long as I can remember. So I, I don't really know how that started. But mm-hmm. there's a really cool festival in, in Brussels that's two weeks every March. And I started going when I was like 15 or 16 and I've kept going every year. And this year was the first time that I could actually go and show my movie, which was very exciting. It was the same place where I met 
I don't know, Wes Craven mm -hmm. and, and Stuart Gordon and people like that and all the people I admired. And then suddenly I get to be on stage and show my film. Which is, that's pretty that's cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah. But that's pretty much the extent of Belgium excitement. Were there like frankly. people that you went to high school with that you hated <laughs> and that, and then, you know, they were at the film festival and they got to see, and they were like seething with rage and jealousy and you were like, ah, <laughs> not going to answer that, that one. Fucking dream, sweet, Heidi. <laughs> right? I'm like, that's like my dream. I'm like, yeah, yeah that would have been awesome. <laughs> yeah. There was a few people in there who I saw walk past, like there were two screening rooms and there's people who don't like me very much who showed up that night because they went to the other film and they were kind of looking at me like, hmm. <laughs> who would not like you? I don't understand yeah. this. Crazy. Nice Asshole people. Are Terrible. schools all girls' schools in Belgium? Or are they like mixed? The one I went to is. I knew it. Why? I just knew it. <laughs> Can't elaborate further. I think an all boys. You shouldn't, you kind of shouldn't of elaborate further. I've seen innocence. <laughs> so I'm just guessing here. I imagine all girls' schools are like uh, phenomena or like um, Suspiria. That's what all schools should be like. Right. In my mind. Sure. Yeah. You're Which a ballet. Is Expert, right? Death. Yeah, yeah exactly. With the witches. Psychedelic. It's, it's so how, the how did you we get into the, uh, the film festival realm? I mean, how did you bridge from like journalism to film festival? Um, well, honestly, um, I was maybe in like 2004 or so. I started a website, which nobody remembers now because it's gone, but um, it was called Pretty Scary. And it was a website for horror for women about, you know, women who like horror by women who like horror. And it was me and a couple other chicks and we ran it and it was kind of cool. And we wrote about women. And one of the things that I found that I was really interested in was horror films directed by women, because it seemed like, especially a decade ago, something that, um, was not, you couldn't really, we didn't have Wikipedia for all the youngsters listening um, you know, you couldn't, there were a lot of directors out there that if they weren't in the encyclopedia and nobody had made a web, a web page dedicated to them, they were not on the internet. And I found this fascinating. So I started researching and looking into horror films directed by women and sort of compiling my own lists and learning more about it. And um, I became interested in the idea of seeking out women who were actively directing horror, you know, contemporary to, to me existing. And so I ended up becoming friends with a lot of these women and wanting to write about their stories. And at the same time, a woman named Shannon Lark, who you guys know from Viscera, decided that she wanted to start a film festival that was dedicated to horror directed by women. And Shannon was like, I really want to do this. I don't know where to find these women directors. And so she asked me, she was like, I know that you know a lot of these people. Like, do you think you could rally a few of them and maybe get them to submit their films? And I was like, yeah, I think I could do that. That sounds like something that would be easy. Um, and then this was like in 2007. And is that before Woman and Horror Month was created? Yeah, No, that was a side event. Okay. Women and Horror Month, I think, came around in 2010. Uh -huh. Yeah, it was a little bit before that, but it was under the table at first. That was created by Hannah Neurotica. Yeah, Hannah Neurotica. Um, out of, I think she's based out of Massachusetts. Or somewhere so. northeast. And uh, yeah, she started that out of a fanzine that she was writing called The Axe Wound. Yeah, which is like a like a feminist horror zine, mm -hmm. riot girl style, where you know it's all cut and paste and black and white and stapled together on the side. It's really something. It's cute. <laughs> and um so so basically Shannon and I did this for a couple of years, um, but we didn't have like an actual festival venue. We kind of just made a we made a compilation DVD at the end of every year. And we were like, this is the viscera, this is viscera 2007, 2008, 2009. I think we even did. Um, and we would let other film festivals show it as like a viscera block. And then finally in 2009, Shannon was like, screw it. Let's do like an actual festival. Let's just like fucking do it. And I was like, okay, uh, how hard can this be? <laughs> and so in 2010, we started putting on an actual film festival in LA of short horror directed by women. And, um, it really just it, it took off from there and it kind of grew into its own little monster. And then last summer was the last time we did Viscera. And um, I wasn't I wasn't quite I'm like still holding on to it with like, you know, my cold dead hands. Like, you know, I just I like I've got my talons in so deep that, um, you know, this is something I really believe in and I'm I'm really passionate about. So I think this is a good a good thing to be doing. So. How, how will Ethereum be different then? For people thinking it's the same thing, repackaged. The genres are different. Uh -huh. um, we have um, a really, I think the films are great. I mean, people may watch them and think they're shit. That's totally fine. I mean, I, I don't have, I mean, I can't 
save it. You know, everybody's going to love everything. I can't. You sure know um, how to sell them. <laughs> 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 but I, I think they're amazing. I mean, I genuinely think these are like amazing films. Like we, I'd say I watched about 200 short films wow. and we are showing seven of them. And what are the, are the rules hard to direct it by? Because I've been to ones of us or where it'd be like a yeah. producer will be one of yeah, the Yeah, we got rid of that. It's got to be directed by. Okay. Just directors. So they're all directed by women, and most of them are made, I mean, most of them are having an L.A. premiere. I think one is not, and that's uh, the Lost, or what's it called, Hide and Seek by Kayoko Asakura, who's a Japanese filmmaker. I think that has screened in L.A. before. I think it was at Scream Fest. I'm mm -hmm. not sure. Um, but yeah, the rest are all L.A. premieres. We've got like a thriller. Um, we have a really funny action film from Australia. It's like, it's really funny. Um, we have a sci-fi comedy and... Rose McGowan's directorial debut screening. It's a thriller called Dawn. A a short. Really, yeah, it's mm -hmm. actually, it's really good. It's, I mean, I w it was submitted and I was like, man, this is going to really suck because how cool would it be to have a celebrity at our film festival? Like, that would be really cool, except her film's going to suck and I'm not going to be able to show it and I'm going to like punch myself in the face. And then it was really, really good. And I was like, yes. <laughs> did she submit it or did you. you have to track her down? Her producer submitted it. Oh, cool. oh wow. Yeah. Um, uh, John Wynn. And in so, case you didn't know, Heidi will give you an honest review yes. of anything you do. <laughs> that makes sense. She's pretty open about it. I'm sorry, go ahead. It's okay. <laughs> um, so, no, but it was really exciting to me because I was like, yeah, this is, I mean, it, but it's actually, it's really impressive. It's a really good little solid movie. And um, I'm always really excited when women transition from acting into directing. I, I find that a lot of women, especially in horror, seem to be doing that. And I'm, I think it's just, it's almost like... Uh, they find that they want to tell their own stories and they have all this onset experience. They've, they've done a lot of stuff. They understand genre, but they understand filmmaking too. And so women like Daniel Harris or Debbie Roshan like tend to make these really cool, awesome little films that are just really super stellar examples of, of you know, modern genre. So that's kind of how I feel about Rose McGowan's movie. It's good. I remember seeing a trailer at, I think it was two Vassars ago for the Jennifer Lynch documentary mm. where she goes to uh, India and gets just the difficulties of being a female director in India trying to make this movie. Yeah. And that the trailer was amazing. And I just yesterday was like tweeting, anyone know if that thing came out? Yeah, I, I was see wondering that And somebody too. wrote to me saying it's playing next week at the downtown film festival. Yeah, it is. Which yeah. is just amazing timing that I literally, it just propped, I think because you were coming on. That film yeah. popped in my head, but yeah. it, it, that looked really fascinating because like we talk about the difficulties being a female filmmaker somewhere like within the American film system, but then thinking about a country that is already so deeply like misogynist in a sense, and, it's, yeah. you know, hard to imagine how she would have gone on that. So you guys should have, you guys should watch the film and have Jennifer on. Yeah, that'd be cool. Cause I've seen the film hiss that it's about the making of, and I mean, it's, it is what it is. I mean, but the girl in it is absolutely breathtaking. Um, I can't even remember her name, but the girl who plays the snake monster. In I it liked her film Surveillance. Amazing. Is this Surveillance mm -hmm. on before with Bill Pullman? Mm -hmm. so that was an yeah. interesting that was a, film. I kind of like Chained, the last yeah, one she yeah. made. I didn't I see thought that. That was pretty good. And then there's Boxing Elena, <laughs> which is fascinating in its own fever dream way. Hey, I would love to see that again now. You know, yeah, seeing that on a big screen yeah. with a group of people yeah. would be amazing. We should do that. Yeah, that yeah. would be yeah. amazing. Yeah. Screen boxing. Why don't we do a jump? Why don't we do a jump cut? Have good. Jennifer there, come down. If there's a Blu-ray of it, that would be cool. Because it is one of those films that was so maligned when it came out. It just never stood a chance. Mm -hmm. Also, there was a big court case, right? Like somebody sued. What was it? Kim Basinger. Kim Basinger, right? Yeah. For not appearing in the film. So I think that overshadowed what it was. But, but, she, to put it in its context, also though, Jennifer was like. I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna say she couldn't have possibly been older than 23 or yeah, so no, when she made the movie. Right. I think it was just like 22 or something. Yeah, it was like she was super young yeah. and it was her first film. And, and she was David wow. Lynch's daughter, which creates just all this a like, weird hype. Yeah, that she bad had to expectation live up to. when you do something that has dream anything in it, and so that's tough. And she'll be very candid. I mean, she's very candid and and uh, will be very honest about what she thinks of that film and his, and talk about the experience of making both of them. So. You know, but that yeah, I just remember seeing the trailer and it looked really interesting to me. I, I mean, I love films, documentaries about filmmaking. Can't get enough of those ones, especially troubled shoots. You know, and that one just looked it looked really interesting. So seek it out if you can. Yeah, that one looks fascinating. Yeah, directed by Penny Wozniak is the uh, oh, so a female the directed yeah. the documentary as well. Yeah, that's very cool. Interesting. Now you also have a tour, which I can oh, speak yeah, firsthand yeah, yeah. about, is amazing um, cool. because one of my films was on the tour th two years ago, three years ago. I'm getting old. Two years um, ago. Two years ago. Yeah, and it has been amazing because I mean, you guys just kind of put it places, and then I'll get emails from like 
Glasgow and Japan telling me that they love my film. And I'm like, oh, man, this is awesome. It's playing like all around the world. Thanks to you guys. Cool. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Um, yeah, we uh, we think it's important to like because here's the thing. We get so many good films. We can't possibly show them all. The Egyptian is like very generous with giving us the amount of time that they do give us. Um, and we got to be out of that place at 11. So we can only show yeah. like, you know, a certain amount of films. Um, but there's so many good films, like really good films that we didn't decide to show. And why not do tier two jump cut tier two? The ones that didn't make them, we'll do a screening for those films. That'd be fun. We could do that, but that you know that might hurt their feelings. If well, they it doesn't like have to be called tier two. <laughs> if be you like forget the, one, the ones that are less good. <laughs> the ones we can that just call that. Somebody um, might be in that. The but, they're, they're yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not that they're less good. Even it's just like sometimes. It's, well, programming is a complicated thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, it's, it's not like because there, there was a a noir that I really liked. Mm-hmm. It was a, a Danish film called Copenhagen Noir. And it was literally a short noir film, and it was great. But it had all male leads, and it was sort of a, it, it was a tough little narrative. It didn't really wasn't, and I just didn't think it would play well with the rest of the films we'd yeah. already you know chosen. That doesn't mean I don't think it's a great film, and I don't think I you know that I want people to see it. So the the purpose of the tour is we give people an archive like other programmers of other festivals or at universities or wherever. And we say, here are all the films we have. We've, you know, we showed these seven at the Egyptian, but we've got 30 or 50 or whatever we have. And you can show any of them you want. So universities will also uh, often be like, I'd like to show films that have a female lead with a, you know, feminist theme, or I'd like to show films that are set in this or about slashers or about whatever. And so they'll, they can pick and choose their own, um, programs for for whatever event they want to do and still support and get these films out there. So Viscera as a database will still exist, even though the Viscera Film Festival is over or not? The be... Viscera database is is not going to, it's not the Viscera database. Mm. It's the films, the filmmakers that were interested in working with Etheria have moved on and moved over to, okay. the, to Etheria. But, um, you know, it wasn't an obligation. You didn't have to if you didn't want to. So. Cool. Nice. Uh, I, and I'm very curious about you getting your first feature made. And uh, was it financed in Belgium? Like, how, how, just what's the no, process? No, I, I, I haven't day? lived in Belgium for ten okay. years, and I have very. In my opinion, you just, just got here. Like, you, you, just got you like just off the boat. It's I think you just walked into this room from Belgium. <laughs> <laughs> my suitcase in my hand. Where did you shoot? Uh, in Wales, in the UK. And uh, we financed it mostly. Well, there's a little bit of Belgian money. I actually, told you. I <laughs> He's seeing it. You got everywhere. it. That film had Belgian money written. On it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's mostly it's mostly financed in in Britain. And um, yeah, and it was shot in Wales. So. Hmm. What What about um, in terms of selecting this story? Because you you'd already done a couple of shorts on your own, mm-hmm. and um, you'd written plenty of stuff. I, I remember you sent me a script once that took place, I think, like in the subways or something. That I, I forgot the oh, name yeah, of it. Oh yeah, yeah. Which it I was, thought was really cool. It was one of my. It was like my second script, I think. It was right. called Underground. Yeah, and yeah, it was this yeah. whole ghost thing in yeah. the underground in London. Yeah. It, it, when I read that now, I'm kind of embarrassed. But hey, you can update it. You can, you can always revise and rewrite. There's so many films now that take place in the underground that it's not even funny. <laughs> there's actually not that many that I can well, think of. And the ones few. that I can think of are really Romy, good. Creep. So, creep. End of the Line. End of the Line. Um, end of the line. That's Deadly, all I got. There's been, parts. Deadly Eyes has a little bit, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's parts been the Chud. few that came out around Chud. the time Chud. that I was developing it. Uh, and Creep came out just when yeah, I was writing. Yeah. So, yeah, it was tough luck. That always well, sucks. It happens a lot, though, because I... I seems like people kind of come up with concepts mm-hmm. simultaneously as a society. So, you know, if one person is doing a werewolf movie, there's 50 other Five people. Other who Dante's yeah. Yeah. Volcano, the I'm, I'm, it's always like a rush to get it out. I'm so. working on a, a Mexican Day of the Dead thing, which is not set in Belgium. Mm. And it's... Uh, <laughs> that would be unique. That'd be amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and there's like, uh, I think Del Toro just had a trailer released for the this animated film that takes place on Day of the Dead. And then oh. there's a Pixar thing that's coming out too. And it's kind of... Really? Man, there's not Once been a film there. about Day of the Dead for years, and, yeah. and now suddenly there's like three. Right. Well, whatever. Here's his, yeah, it's yeah. your, yeah, your it's unique spin stuff. on whatever it is will stand out. I mean, that's, yeah, and if it's animation. So. Mm-hmm. But I guess my like question a, is, so so you've had other scripts and other things kind of that you've worked on. Uh, what were the circumstances that Soulmate well, the became? the big difference is that, um, well, there's two big differences. One is that I finally actually liked the script that I was writing. <laughs> okay. Which is pretty important. <laughs> and the other thing is that I, the other ones I wrote because I thought it was fun and I wanted to learn how to write. Mm-hmm. 
And this one I wrote because I thought um, maybe I can get a little bit of money and maybe I can find a location. We The, the way it happened was that I, I was on um, I was on holiday and I was going through the, the countryside in Britain and I found this amazing little village that looked very atmospheric and I felt like, wow, it's, Britain used to be very famous for ghost stories and for books about ghosts and things like that. And, and they haven't been in a while. It was way before A Woman in Black and all those films came out. Mm-hmm. And I felt like maybe I should bring it back. Maybe I should, you know, do something that goes back to that kind of gothic genre that hasn't been exploited in a while. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I figured I'll never get much money to make it. So I, I basically wrote two people in a house. And just one of them happens to be a ghost, and that's one of the things. Is and it's it's I think it's um, it's a uh, it shows how great my cinematographer was. That people think this is an actual movie with actual money in it, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> who, but who it really it? isn't. Shot it. Who was the cinematographer? It's a girl oh. called Sarah Dean. Uh-huh. Um, then I found the guy who's going to shoot it dropped us like three weeks before the shoot or oh. something, like just when we were in pre-production. And uh, and so I obsessively started looking at showreels and looking at people and and um, and for some reason we had a lot of heads of departments were women and after looking at lots of showreels I was like well maybe maybe there's a woman DP because what it seems like was we could find all those amazingly talented women who just generally turn out to be the best for the job every time and they would work for the money we had which was again not much um, and I I. Th- Feel like I get the feeling that a lot of people don't want to work with female heads of department or maybe have something like, oh, a female director of photography. This is kind of weird or I don't know. But I got the feeling that somehow we got people available and willing to work for not much um, more easily. And so I looked at female cinematographers and the second showreel I saw was hers. And it was just amazing. And every single shot was just exactly what I like. The framing was exactly what I like. There was nothing in there where I could go, okay, I can see how this could go wrong. Well, everybody else that I'd seen in the previous days was, oh, I don't like this. Or, Had she done features or just short? She'd done features, yeah. Mm-hmm. She'd done all kinds of things. She'd done commercials, and but nothing huge. And um, and she's awesome. She's just she's this little adorable little woman who's super energetic and, and happy. She and she's uh, She's British. Mm. Do you have Welsh actors? Because I always like Welsh accents. <laughs> I can't understand a word of what Welsh people say. Like Scottish people make total sense to me. And I've, I can't believe Gary of Oldman's movie was subtitled. That still blows my mind. That, see, no by mouth. That just blew no my mind. That, to that me, was I can't understand a goddamn uh, thing Scottish, Scottish people, people make total sense. Like, but Welsh they, people, they, I'm just like, I don't know what you're saying. They read train spotting for America. I know. That's, mm-hmm. oh, America, that's what is wrong? I need, that was for me. Like, I needed that. But were yeah. there any, well, where were the actual actor performers? No, they were cast in London. Okay. But there's only five people. Five people plus my dog. That's the, the entire cast oh, for the whole thing. Your dog has a lot of, a lot of screen time. I yes. <laughs> that's where you can tell there's not much producer interference. It's all the completely gratuitous close-ups of my dog. <laughs> Who's Welsh. <laughs> I hope so, he's in so you, so you wrote this, spe- this is the first thing you wrote specifically as... You know, something for you to direct. Well, and also I thinking wrote it originally thinking, I don't know if I'm going to be acting in this because at the time I was trying to act, but it was one of those things where I never felt like I had never felt very comfortable being a, an actor. It mm-hmm. was just I had the opportunity to try and I did it very seriously. I put two years of my life into desperately trying to do something I'm really not good at. And I thankfully figured it out when I was when I was writing the script was I really enjoyed writing and I really I've always wanted to be a filmmaker, not not in front of the camera. And this is a big mistake I'm making. And so at some point it's kind of like, okay, I'm going to have to prove myself somehow and, and make it. Do you know how you learned that? Like, was there a particular moment, like, were you acting in somebody's thing where you realized there I was suck. a disconnect? Or <laughs> 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 just a disconnect in your desire? Because I think uh, a lot of people are like that. I think no, when, I'm, when I was on set, I actually really liked it. It's the business that goes with it is not very good. Also, obviously, being Belgian, when say, I can't, I've never talked about Belgium this much in my life. <laughs> About Belgium, <laughs> awful. French but, fries but I have, with mayonnaise. I'm not. I don't sound British, so I, I, I had this issue with casting directors uh, that they were like, "Oh, you're like, we can cast you as an international woman right. of mystery." It, it just didn't work. Uh, and, and then on top of that, I'm yeah, I'm not good. So I know that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's good. That kind of honesty, I like. <laughs> and so, like, what has the reaction been to people who have seen it? Because I, I, I know, obviously, what's been in. 
the press, which to me is Facebook. <laughs> I love that I'm going to call Facebook the press. What's been in the Facebook lately have been the controversy about the, the cuts, the things, oh, that, yeah. the articles you've been sharing mm-hmm. about what I assume, what are they called? Not the MPAA there, but the BBFC for Britain, the British Board of Film Certificate, who are still living in the some crazy past. Oh, oh, nasty. Is it still just, exists yeah, is it just what? me or do they are they like I don't know what's wrong in strict? I mean, like I can't even. They, conceive well, the, that the one thing is that the difference with the MPAA is that the MPAA is not mandatory. It mm-hmm. is in terms of commercial releasing your movie yeah like you can't put it out on the screen yeah like because Netflix most won't accept it right. yeah and most big I'm guessing you movie take a chains financial won't. hit if you do exactly it yeah. but in the UK if, if you don't get your film certified it's as I understand it, it's actually illegal to even own a film right. that is refused sort of, which yeah. is very punk rock. My film is banned in the UK. It's it is so pretty bad. Which is the yeah. stuff that they were cutting from it. I mean, are we talking like, you know, crazy we're, sexual debauchery? No, no, that? no. My film is so mild. And that's, the, thing. that's it, the thing that's most at, embarrassing. infuriating reading yeah. what yeah. they're making. I thought I was going to get film. a 12. I thought I was going to get like a 12 or a 15 at most. And then they submitted the opening scene, which is a, a suicide attempt. Um, for advice and the advice came back that, that we were going to have to make cuts and it, it isn't, no way no way this is this is a joke Come, it's submit a it go ahead thing, isn't it it's like it's never usually what you think it's going to be it will be like I remember that documentary about um, the Kirby Dick documentary about censorship and it was all largely focused on Kimberly Pierce's uh, Boys Don't Cry yeah. and about how the mm. main thing they had an issue with was the the smile on the face after the orgasm, mm. even though they don't know that that's what they have a problem with when they're when they're picking it up. But you look at all the things they're asking for, and that's what it's why so they're weird. having a problem. It's so so weird. it's it's very. I think it is. Yeah, it's very psychological how they're making these choices. It's it's weird. Well, so here it seems like they those? have a specific thing um, about what More happens is that uh, the opening scene is the girl, the main girl. She's hit rock bottom, and it's very important in the film that we show that because the whole f- film is this journey that she goes. She goes from wanting to kill herself to wanting to live at the end, and so the whole thing is about that, which is very anti-suicide as a message, generally speaking. I mean, we have some guy coming from the dead saying it was a really dumb idea to kill myself, right. so you can't make it any more anti-suicide than we have. Um, but in the opening scene, you can see that she cuts her veins and she cuts them vertically, and that's the thing that really gets on their. Maybe UK is pro suicide, and so, that's the problem with your film. You never know. <laughs> so if we were, if we had the same rules as the UK, could I not show your film on the twelfth? If would it be illegal? we had the same rules, you would have to get a special permission to show it theatrically, which you would never get. Come see the unrated version. Yes, yes. 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 exactly. The July 12th, yeah. the the film that was banned, but then you also don't want that advertising. But the thing is, it's, it's not the kind of it's not the film. kind of movie yeah. that I've made. Stuff. The thing yeah. is, if people come because they think it's going to be terrifying or something, it, this is just not the film I've made. This is this is like saying that Jade Eyre was too gory or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it's really. It's that not that pretty, kind of thing. I liked. I thought that was creepy. It was atmospheric. <laughs> I know. I'm serious. I thought that was a very atmospheric film, Jania. Well, I this mean, is this is that kind of. It's kind of creepy, and it's and the opening scene is very realistic. The the suicide attempt, and that's one of the things I thought. The more responsible way of showing a suicide was to make it an appealing. So I've done some research, which is how I found the the vertical cuts. Mm-hmm, obviously, yeah. everybody can do their research online and yeah. find out the information. I actually I remember in the craft they say, "Oh, you did it the right yeah. way," which yeah, is how right. I learned that this is. So why that didn't get cut out when mine is supposed to be given instructions to people that they might kill themselves? I, I don't I don't really get it. But but I thought the most responsible way of showing it was to show that it's unpleasant and that it's painful and that it's horrible. And her hands cramp, you know, get cramps and, and you can see on her face that it really hurts. And because most of the time when you have those kinds of versions that look very um romantic and very beautiful it's almost appealing and here it doesn't make suicide look appealing at all but hey that's the version they nope, want to cut you're corrupting the youth of britain exactly did you ever see that uh, there was a documentary called the bridge where it uh, documented the san francisco mm-hmm, bridge and, mm-hmm. and i what i the one thing that reminds me of your film is that they i think there's five people who survived jumping you know most people would not die and all five of them had the exact same quote which was they all said the second they stood off they wish they hadn't the mm-hmm. second their feet left the bridge. Oh, they regretted I, it. I know that would happen to me. Like, I yeah, know. No, I, mean, <laughs> I just know it. Because you would suddenly find something to live for when I'm it's too late. I'm too wishy-washy. Yeah. 
But, um, you know, we didn't come here oh, to film horrible. just anti-suicide. <laughs> 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 but is that, I mean, so do you think in the UK is gonna is that going to trouble its release? Do you have to make these I'm cuts? I'm hoping it, it's not because at the moment as the only DVD is going to be out. So mm. I have to make these cuts. Otherwise, the film can't get released. And so they've asked for a total of 16 seconds, which is basically what they said is every time the knife is parallel to her wrist or the knife is held vertically, which is like... we. <laughs> Wrong, right. Good news. Wrong. Really? Sorry. <laughs> Will the intention still come across? Will you be able to tell I'm this? cutting out the scene completely. Oh, oh wow. Oh, no. I, yeah, so that's wow. two and a half minutes they're coming out instead of 16 seconds. And how but do you think that will change the meaning of the film, do you think? I think... I think for one thing, it doesn't look very, it looks mangled when you show it with the 16 seconds cut out. And that's just, it's not the impact that I want to have. And and it's also the whole point of showing the vertical cuts is that she gets saved at the end of the scene. And I don't want it to look like it was just a call for help. This needs to be shown as she really wanted to kill mm. herself. She's not just looking for attention. And so if you cut that out, also th it looks really awkward because she picks up the knife and before she even gets it close to her wrist, um, you get to a close up of taps running, and then and then she has magically the knife in the other hand, and then yeah. you see a door, and then she's in the bath that's full of blood. And is like, what exactly happened? It it, it just it hmm. doesn't work, and so I'd rather cut it out. And you can pick up on the fact that she killed herself because she has she has bandages on on her wrists, and hmm. and she talks about it. I bet you money that if it was a flashback, that it wouldn't have even been cut. Like, I mean, like if, if you put that same scene later and put a layer, a freaking filter over it, they would probably look at it as, oh, well, we know she survived because she, here she is. And I hate, I hate that thing. Yeah. Because, you know, rather the, the, they're scared of like the immediacy of it, of what it's representing, it seems to me. Weirdly, but. they said that they don't like the fact that she survives. <laughs> what? I, I, I know. Theory that <laughs> <all English people laughs> they don't like, good. they don't like the fact that she survives because it might send the message that it's not fatal oh oh that wow. it might be a good but way to call for attention but that's the, here's the problem who the fuck are they <laughs> like who are these they like is it like the mpw who are which those are, people you know, over 18 that need to be protected from yeah. my movie yeah but i mean i mean that mpa documentary basically proved it was almost all suburban housewives you know in their 50s who were just aren't even watching movies which and pulled which into a room, brings me you know? to the other thing that they said because we found another film that um had an opening scene that had someone who kills himself and he kills himself the same way, and you can see the cuts. And as far as I know, as far as I'm aware, it was passed uncut in Britain. So it seemed like it was a massive double standard. So we appealed the decision, and what came back was that they said there's the fact that she survives, but there's also they take into account the potential target audience. The target audience for that film is probably males 15 to 20. The target audience for my film is women a little bit older. So do they think women are more likely to be influenced? That's my, that's I mean, what I wow. think they believe. I mean, if maybe if they're all emotional and crying over men all the yeah. time. Maybe if the women that watch the movie ice cells. cream and, yeah. maybe if the women that watch the, the movie film. aren't married, they might be. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if they depressed don't have enough. Or they didn't that's she very depressing. Yeah. I mean, if they're like over 30 and not married, I mean, that's like. Yeah. And they'll be busier cooking. They're just so, waiting yeah. for my film to show them how to do it. If only I'd gone shoe shopping instead. I mean, it would have saved us all. So. Did you learn anything like from having that, having to go through that with a, a key scene? Does that make you think differently if you're making a following film or does is it more just no, like a no, fuck you with, no. if you had to go through I it? I could never have seen that coming. That's yeah. insane. Yeah. No, and did you it, grow up with video and nasty? And it's, and it's so England, weird but. because again, the film is really mild. There's and, and we cut out the scene with the scene in the 16 seconds cut out. We would have had an 18. Now we cut out the scene. They still give me a 15. I don't know what the hell is still in there. That's still What's upsetting them so much. Yeah, it's uh, well, I'm confused by people. This oh, system. sorry. It's people under eighteen can't go see it, oh. or people under fifteen. Mm. You were like eighteen plus. Yeah, you are so yeah. extreme. This is oh like I'm treated like a porn Gasper film Noe. or something. You it's are weird. Gasper Noe. <laughs> is it yeah. Not even. No, he gets his films uncut. <laughs> really? No. That, really? I mean, none of none of the films that you you would think of, like the the, the, the hostel movies uh -huh. and all that, they never got caught to get. What about Brown Bunny, wow. the Gasper? Or wait, no, wait, no, that, that wasn't. Gallo, that yeah, was yeah. Gallo. Human yeah. Centipede two and the Serbian <laughs> film are the most mistake, recent though. examples. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Human Centipede was cut. The second one, not oh, yeah. the first one. And again, it's probably because of, yeah, the extremism. It was not banned. The, I think it was banned uh, and it was released online or something like that. And Serbian film had to have cuts, but the mm. rape and but yeah, your films that. are yeah. nowhere. Big difference. Yeah. Not Serbian anyway, film. But, no. <laughs> what a Serbian yeah, film. Yeah, it's a completely different. <laughs> <laughs> Did we talk about this last week? How the guy from you know the guy who showed it in, in Spain got it was two weeks ago because I yeah. talked about it with oh, yeah. regards to the video nasties and that. how we're still persecuting people yeah. today. Did you? So. Now I was just curious on that. That did you. 
in Belgium were, did the video nasty <laughs> so Belgium. back to Belgium <laughs> well, no, you did. she grew up in Belgium uh, <laughs> Did no? Did the video nasty? No, I had, I, was that influenced by I, England at all, or not? Really? I don't think so. Okay, so I you think, could have just seen anything. I think it's just a little bit too young to catch up on the whole thing. Yeah. In, a, in any case, so I'm. But it's still. I'm not I mean, sure. it's still kind of going, right? Like, were you talking about how The Exorcist is only just recently? Well, it's clearly yeah. still released. going because yeah. they're yeah. doing that with my film. It's, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure we'll hear from a lot of our British because we actually. Do but have Necromatic quite a few UK was just passed for the first time yeah. uncut in Britain the week that wow. they banned. <laughs> Sorry. Ross, yeah. like, wait, we put this online? <laughs> let us know. Yeah, like, really? uh, Jonathan have... Hughes, I think. Oh, that's right, of, yeah. Uh, so if you're Brit hey, I know the Jonathan Hughes guy. He messages me on Facebook yeah. all the time. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Jonathan, you listening? Yeah. He, he now knows about where you. to look. <laughs> <laughs> You've told him now. But I'm just curious if it's still, uh, like, especially with those classic movies that were video nest, if they're still as difficult to find or if there's any titles that are particularly. I know Cannibal Holocaust for me was still never came to New Zealand. I know that there are some that are still banned there that you still can't find there. Yeah. But um, and again, I, I but think in Britain like, they're not banned; they're just cut, cut severely. I mean, it's bad enough, but I, I don't know how cut those ones are. But again, Necromantic was just passed on cut the week that they banned. Michael. So Necromantic gets through. Seems yeah, reasonable. But yeah. You, but you my even. <laughs> gothic romance thing does not go through. So. Wow, it's very strange. You should have had, had more no sex idea. with dead bodies. There's mm-hmm. not even language. I mean, the only bad <laughs> word in the whole <laughs> film is uh, on on the, the the audio commentary. Yes, he fucked the BBFC, and that's that's the end. The entire. <laughs> wow. There's nothing wow. else. That's Heard what it here first. That probably did it. <laughs> that probably did it right there. Interesting. Uh, what about influences and, and like, you know, obviously because you wrote for Fangoria and, and had a lot of on-set experience and acted, um, did you feel prepared when you went to direct this and what, what kind of influences were you calling into? I felt like, reasonably prepared, but probably not so much because I'd spend time on set because I'm not sure you can, I don't know, I don't, do you, You've been on set. You know what I, directors I, look like they're doing. I'm miserable. They're, I, I they look like they're doing nothing. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> My brother visited the set of Centurion and and he saw he saw Neil Marshall directing and and he was like, "Wow, he looks like he's thinking really important things all the time." And Neil turns to me and he's like, "I don't know which dessert to get." <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget Darren Bowsman on Devil's Carnival. Yeah, Dave and her, uh, it was uh, me and That's the first Dave. time I met her. Yeah, we first met um, when we were funny. doing a set visit on Devil's Carnival, and you were there with Stacey. Hopefully Darren's not listening to this And um, <laughs> so this is actually, that was one of my first set visits, too, because yeah. I had just moved to L.A., and we were doing our set visit. That, and this was, like, my first, like, official L.A. set visit and everything. And he brings Elric and I in, and he's, like, having a conversation with us. While action is happening. <laughs> yeah. and and like, oh, oh, I, I have, action, I've and had one of those around. experiences. And start yeah. talking with us. And he's and like, look like, at this iPad. Look at this kick-ass <laughs> stuff we shot before. Man, this is so cool. That's awesome. While the actors are going, oh, how is that? I've had like, exactly sh- that <laughs> when I visited the set of a uh, Uwe Ball movie. Oh, well, yeah. Well, <laughs> well, <laughs> wait, let's not love Darren and you. <laughs> <laughs> no, Sorry, while there. We were there um, Ogre from Skinny Puppy. Oh, yeah, that's right. I was like, so excited to meet. He pops his head and he goes, was that okay, Darren? And Darren's like, oh, yeah, that's great. Let's yeah, do, do it again. again. <laughs> and then his action turns back around, yeah, continues the conversation. It was really funny. I do remember really thinking about that. I was in South Africa and I got to visit the set. I got to. Well, yeah. I somehow managed to see the set uh, of Tunnel Rats, one of Uwe uh, Ball's movies. Oh, I don't know. Um, it's like a Vietnam that And that would have been a perfect thing. addition to our Deadly Eyes category. <laughs> I think killer it's... Rat movies. Yeah, and it's actually, it's a, it's a war film, so it's oh, not... It's they're not real rats. Metaphorical rats. Oh. Um, yeah, I know. Very disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he was... I. Um, he sits me next to him and then he starts showing me all those trailers for Postal because he's very excited about Postal. And meanwhile, the action is going on and he keeps filming. And at some point, just randomly, he looks at the monitor and he goes, cut! And then he turns to me and goes, a masterpiece. And he's gone. <laughs> <laughs> I, I fucking love him. That's <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> he's like, too. Yeah. I, I remember, I very briefly, I remember he was at a Fangoria Weekend of Horrors, I think maybe Chicago, New York. You might have even been there for all I know. But I remember he was promoting uh, seed. What, no, not seed. What's the blood? Blood uh, rain? rain. Blood rain. Oh, rain yeah. uh-huh. He's promoting blood rain too, and like it's like I guess it's like Saturday night, you know. And he's in the lobby, and lead actress from Blood Rain Two is like, "Movie, what's going on? Are we, are we going to go out for drinks or something?" He's like, "I got to go shoot another movie." <laughs> <laughs> he's got what's going on like, in his hotel like, room yeah, right that now. Night. He's going to shoot. Yeah, something. how did he do? I, I've read so many things on the internet saying that he has some pact with the devil because he's just constantly <laughs> making a movie, but then no one likes the movies. I'm, I am genuinely curious what apparently, kind of apparently they do did. really well in Germany. I don't uh-huh. know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, apparently that's it. That's it. Nazi gold, and they do really well in Germany. <laughs> Nazi gold. I like that. Nazi gold. <laughs> 
I met. I think we met in Texas somebody who got his ass kicked by Yui. I can't remember. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. It may have been a Chris. Oh, Chris oh, Alexander. Yeah, yeah. That's right. When he got his ass kicked. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway. He talks about that himself. He that, does. that was pretty he damn tells awesome. Good did about Chris him. know he was a boxing champion when he got in the ring? I don't know. I've never really asked didn't. him about it. But that I knew about we it should've. before I started working with Chris. So for a while, it was like my elephant in the room where yeah. I was like, don't mention he got his ass kicked by Uwe. But then after a while, Chris, I mean, they're friends now. So it definitely, you know, we work a lot with Uwe now. So it comes out. But yeah, Chris like takes that. it with like a grain yeah. of salt now. So pretty fun. they're good. So, yeah, yeah, back to uh, Rob was asking some of the films that did influence you just in terms of just not even this particular film, but films that like, I don't know, I think we've all discussed at times on the show films that go beyond just, oh, I love that film. That film actually inspires me to make my own work or I, I, you know, seeing I saw Roman Polanski short films once and realized you could make films like it wasn't until seeing like a handcrafted short that I kind of got that vibe. But I don't know if you had a moment like that. I don't know if I had one moment. I, I, it's a. I, I, when I was growing up, my, my parents wouldn't let me watch horror movies and they didn't until I was about 16. So any horror movie that I would see before that, I would have to watch the tape when they were away. And then, and then my brother would be at the window and look and spy if they're, they're coming back. So we'd just stop the film and take the tape and it was pretty great. But, Mm. but then when I was, um, I think when I turned 17 or something, they said I could have my own TV. And that was the, the difference between not watching any horror movies <laughs> and watching five horror movies a day. It was mm. like massive. And so I remember this crazy time where suddenly I discovered The Fly and Reanimator and uh, and and all of Tim Burton's films, and which I'd seen before, but just kind of, it, it was all watching, binging on horror movies and thinking, wow, I'm really liking this. There's something really special. And again, knowing that I've always liked horror and I used to read books instead and and watch whatever I could, but I, I would think the fly and reanimator for mm. some reason are the two that stuck out. I those, think it's, those are my picks. Well, for of course, our topic, yeah. When we got the topic, they're two of mine. <laughs> but it's also funny to think that like our generation discovered all those movies alone for the most part, like mm-hmm. not the way movies are made. Mm-hmm. Movies yeah. are literally made for a theater and, stuff, yeah. and then it started changing. But like literally our generations like discovering them either with a buddy or friend or somebody or by ourselves in a yeah. room and creating like this direct one-on-one relationship, which maybe is even more powerful back then when you're well, young. I yeah, I mean, so. I think at that age, that's kind of like, that's part of the appeal of the, yeah. the forbidden fruit. Like yeah. my yeah. parents don't want me watching. And it. especially yeah. the yeah. watching it alone to. thing, because <laughs> so many of these like little obscure horror films that I still champion to no end was because I discovered them alone watching USA up all night or, you know, shows like that, or just flipping through Cinemax and finding this little forbidden fruit that I couldn't tell my parents I was in my room watching. But yeah, I mean, mm. that's where I discovered a lot of these was. Yeah. It's, it is weird because because the, the the theatrical experience we always champion it and yet I think that's not how I saw almost ninety well, percent. But of now time. I mean because we live in L A it's 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 those movies that we discovered as a kid it's fun seeing them now. Oh well, yeah, definitely. With the theater. theatrically mm-hmm. in a big screen. I mean again, Deadly Eyes was like I'd never heard of the movie, but seeing a little I thought it was a cool little gem. I had a lot of fun with I it. Like seeing it. it with a group of people. What's wrong, oh, what what wrong with Ryan Turk? I'm going to watch it. wrong with Ryan He hated the movie. He said it was terrible. I'm like, what's wrong with it? He left before the Q&A. Did he really? Yeah. It's a good Q&A. Well, I'm going to watch it on Blu-ray this week, so I will alone. report on what it's like to watch I think I, I, got, that, I, think I got that screener, too. Yeah. Let's watch it yeah. alone. Okay. Together? I, I think another thing that That's was great sexy. about not being able to watch movies at the time was the anticipation was so completely different yeah. from what we mm-hmm. have now. Mm-hmm. Now we go watch films and we know everything before we even start watching them. And you at can the have time, almost anything you want anytime. Yeah, like, and at basically. the time it was like someone would see a film and they'd tell you, I remember my cousin telling me about Hellraiser and it was the scariest thing I'd ever heard. Mm-hmm. I was scared. I hadn't seen the frame of the film, but I was already scared just thinking about it. And then, and then you, you see, you'd find magazines and you'd find this one picture. Or I remember being fascinated at the video store by the box for street trash. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. just, it, and it sticks in your mind. And, and then when you actually watch the film like 10 years later, you go, oh, whatever. Yeah, it's very different than these. Right. I love the movie, but yeah, the, my imagination on that image of the guy going down yeah. the toilet was like way more extreme. Oh, yeah. than oh <laughs> which which image was it that you had on the it's cover? Like, it's like a guy, it's like an, a drawing of a guy getting flushed down the toilet. Mm-hmm. And, he, and he's okay. holding on to the, the cord, but his hands separated from his okay. body. And, yeah. The box I was familiar with was just uh, shoes with just the ankles sticking oh, yeah. out. Yeah. That too. And the <laughs> that burnt off great. ankles, yeah. You know, I had a conversation this weekend with one of my former students about um, 
the way that people select movies now. So I have to share with you guys because mm-hmm. I found it fascinating. When I was a kid, I selected movies based off box covers. Yeah. And 90% of the time, I never even read the back. The back was completely inconsequential. I just looked at the box cover and said, holy shit, this looks awesome. I'll watch it. But now when younger generations look through Netflix, do they read the write-ups Ooh, good more question. so than look at the the art that goes along with it? Or when they're at Netflix or uh, what do you call it? Redbox and things like that. I don't know anybody who's that a younger generation. Fascinating. Redbox is also that is fascinating new, because so. I, cause we're, we're about the same age. Yeah. And I did the same thing. You go in the video store, you look at the box cover. Mm-hmm. Half the time it actually it was created after the fact and doesn't have, is not a still from or the film or anything. Or they made it beforehand yeah. and then made the movie to match so, but, it. Yeah. But it's all you have to go on. And now when I go on Netflix... I read the synopsis. Yeah, and I'm I don't really look at the picture. Do you know what I, I do? I think I only look at the stars on Netflix. Really? I'm not even kidding. <laughs> I mean, unless it's something I'm looking for. If it's like, like I think Scream Time I looked up not when we were doing anthologies. It's one I was not aware of. And as soon as I started star writing, I couldn't even push play because it was like one or half a star. And I'm just like, yeah, I have a limit now. Yeah, you know what? My star- I can't go. I'm, I'm, I won't watch anything over three. Hasn't that terrible? Yeah. Over three, yeah. Under three That's stars. That's what stopped me three from stars. watching Coppola's Twixt, which I really, I want to see it. Oh, but but every single time I see it, it's like, it's free on Netflix. But every single time I see two and a half stars, I'm like, I can't do it. You I have can't. to watch it at his house. Wow. <laughs> I guess mixing the sound and giving you the projector himself. We're giving oh, Netflix so much power. <laughs> Like, well, no, and Netflix, but, that's a problem, too, because you do you do kind of give it power because you assume, oh, anything on there is going to be worth watching. And sometimes it'll just be terrible. There's crap. times where certain deals fall through for them and they lose a lot of their stuff. Mm-hmm. And other times where when it's like everything's like the stuff and saying, else, I'm like, oh, wow, there's a lot of good but stuff. That's, that's always in flux. Though. Yeah, yeah. You know, people always complain like, oh, my God, we're losing all these titles. Like, yeah, but there's like millions of other ones on there. But, but it's I, like we're I it's like they're curators, and yeah. that just seems weird. But I need yeah. to ask our younger viewers because the youngest person I know is John Humphrey, and I mm-hmm. don't know if he counts because he's like a diehard fan anyway. They don't um, read. They don't read on Netflix. So no one else reads. Well, what, did I to, just get old? And I don't. Well, yeah. Also, think about the lettering now. system, right? On not on Netflix, but on on demand. <laughs> on red, yeah, yeah, yeah. That we're changing titles to have numbers or A's in them. Like, because ah, they really zombie. don't believe. Ah, <laughs> yeah, they Nobody's really don't believe you. that anyone will go any further down. So if you're, for instance, soulmate, is going to have to be called a soulmate in America <laughs> <The American laughs> to I, jump up the... I jump, actually to so the, jump like, first. the system, um, Dave and I use Hulu a lot to watch mm-hmm. movies, and the system that you use to toggle through the available movies on Hulu is different depending on which system you're watching it on. So, like, we have two different boxes in the house, and it's different, but if we're watching it on the TV downstairs, it takes forever to toggle through the movie selections. And by the time I get to see, I'm sick of doing it because it takes so long to load. And that's partially because so, everyone's changed their title to be ABC. Yeah. So suddenly there's, like, a hundred titles and then as you go, you get to like the sacrament and it's all alone, yeah. you know, or something like that. It's, it's true. It's really weird. I've talked to two people, on, you know, who run companies who change the name. Uh, they changed our zombies. They're uh, yeah, level 32. So and it's, and it's kind of different. amazing when you hear them talk. You're like, really? We think that little of, you know, people's patience. But maybe they're right. So maybe you young people tell us. You young people. You young people in the UK. We want to hear from you. <laughs> He's and if you're Welsh. Right, very or slowly. Belgian, <laughs> yeah. Well, the, yeah. There's no Belgian listeners. Trust me, I know that they're watching Dardine films. <laughs> That's just one. what they do there. <laughs> so, but yeah, I'm interested in younger viewing habits to find out what the differences are, and you know how you select movies today mm-hmm. as opposed. I'm going to do a case study. It's also interesting to see how codified all the marketing has become, and I I was um, because the film is just coming out in the UK. I've just been through that process of seeing people coming up with the poster and with all the artwork that we can release at the same time. And they said that everything is dictated by supermarkets. Mm-hmm. And it's things like, uh, oh, this supermarket is not going to take it because the cover is blue. And if it's a <laughs> horror, we should have a red wash over the whole thing. And we don't want to do that because it's not that kind of film. So they're not taking it. I mean, it's, it's very strange. It's like, mm. who the fuck? Like, this is, I filed this under, like, I have, like, a mental file called, like, how does this person have a job? <laughs> and, like, I'm constantly <laughs> filing shit into that every day and like i just don't understand like how is that even like a thought how is that even like a company when policy? when did like, we give so that weird. power to yeah. supermarkets yeah but yeah. i can I, I hate the process but i see it so predominantly especially working at fangoria and we go to afm every year american film markets and this is where a huge amount of films especially on the the b level of horror films not i wouldn't even call them b level but not the ones that you see you know playing in a thousand theaters across the nation 
Um, this is where films like that get bought and sold. So something like Sacrament, I'm sure, you know, actually I saw it at AFM last year and they were trying to sell internationally there. But um, every year I go, there's this core group of people um, that we always go with and we play AFM bingo. <laughs> and literally, because what people do is they put up posters of the movies that they're trying to sell and we will determine what the predominant trend is then and whoever can see that trend the quickest. And you have to write down where it is and we do it through texting and um, yeah, you Tornadoes. Like puppies, and, and puppies and tornadoes. So, tornadoes. Puppies, puppies and tornadoes last year were the big ones. And a shot, um, and this was on every horror movie poster, a close-up of a girl's face oh, as yeah. she's being oh, drug away that. with oh, her yeah. hands Oh, outstretched. I remember that. Yeah. That, that was on every... Now that, and it was, was even on Morgan Peter Brown's Absentia film, but then they reused it on um, I Didn't Come Here to Die. There was a couple There's of them so many. Do, do we know what the patient zero of that one was? Like, was it? what was it before Absentia? It was just default art. Oh, was it? That was the first? It was default art. Wreck is kind of... They were kind of copying that from Wreck. The final quarantine yeah, without the tunnel. Quarantine. Well, yeah, quarantine. I know no, it was Rick used on at least five no. well, maybe horror here, films. So, and then um, the red wash one was another one. A close up of half of somebody's face with mm. red wash. Oh, and yeah, they well, there used to be everywhere. half of somebody's face and then the skull. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, Yeah, that was. And close up on a single eye, just Mm -hmm. one eye is always like, that one's always there. And it runs in hard trivia questions. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) So, but as much as I hate it, I see it happen so much. And even like last year, I was there with a filmmaker friend of mine. And um, I went into one of the sales meetings with him and one of the companies said, can you put, and this is where the dog thing came from, because I kept joking about how everybody wanted puppies. And they said to him, can you put a dog front and foremost on the poster? And he said, there isn't even a dog in the movie. And they were like, (laughs) just put a dog on the poster. (laughs) And that's what they're going to sell it on is a fucking dog. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to redo the poster. Yeah, we're going to redo the poster. We're going to put a new dog. Your dog. dog. (laughs) And yeah, it'll just be like my dog, the soulmate. Will be the new title, right? Or a whatever. We'll figure it out. A dog, but just Red a giant, wash. giant picture of the dog. You know, with like a wacky sort of. Family I'd go in the for background. that. Yeah. What's What's <laughs> sad though is that you were saying, uh, you know, the thing about supermarkets and not that we think that's stupid, but it is. What's even sadder than that is. Is that it actually does make sense because there's nowhere for these movies anymore? Oh no! Because I mean, no, that's the one stores. place. If you don't sell them in supermarkets, right. it's, it's just not going to. And sell it's at really all. sad because they're, we're not selling them for collectors. Like people like Scream Factory are releasing nostalgic things that yeah. people want to own, but your average new film, no one wants to own it yet because they haven't seen it. Yeah. Exactly. So then re- these red boxes take over, and they're very selective. And there's maybe three horror films at a time. You know, there'll be a couple you haven't heard of, and then some bad ripoff type thing, and then the one film you were looking for. And so it's really, it's a really complicated. Market marketplace and that and video on demand it's like it's really sad to think that there's like in the old days where you could just get that into video stores and know people would make money off it the video store people you would make it it was worth everyone's time i'm like now it's a scary what's a different market market, and and people have to account for you know i mean screen factories admitted it it's like the goal is to get into walmart walmart is the big thing because physical media is dying or practically Mm -hmm. dead i mean not to us we're collectors we'll go out of our way to get these films but if you but think even of, you don't collect many new movies. Yeah. Not not right away because yeah, right. it's you know it's expensive. Exactly. Yeah, yeah so. because it's unproven. And but it's, you know. middle America right. is you know not is is Walmart's. That's what it's right. made up of. But so. I'm so confused by the Walmart audience because I got to see this firsthand with the Fango distribution. So Fango, we've done DVD distributions for the right. past couple There's of years, where we'll pick like eight lesser known movies and put them out under the Fango logo. And what has happened the past two times we've done this? The one movie that I think is the weakest of the bunch, they will put some type of snazzy cover on, let Walmart dictate it, and then that thing, they'll mark it for like a bottom basement price, like six bucks, and it will become our most profitable film just because it's in Walmart. I started in Target. Wow. I, though, yeah. I think the one you're talking about recently, I saw the Fangoria logo on a Target one. I was like, oh, wow, they got this in Target. That's surprising. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. those ones that, well, mo- we took most of them to Target this mm. time, but the one that we got in Walmart was our most profitable one, and it was what I consider to be the weakest film. So, um, but it's people who yeah. just buy purely based on the artwork. Mm-hmm. They're not interested in anything else. That's so. not any different from how I used to select. Yeah, movies. the exploitation. Maybe we're back to beginning, but um, yeah. Maybe yeah. I just I just don't know. I just I hope another marketplace opens. I hope something happens where there's another way, not necessarily for the collecting side. That's not as important to me as just people wanting to see these things. You of know? course, of course. Yeah. I think I mean we're in a really weird. It's really hard for us to see because yeah, we're right in the thick of it. Right. We're in a strange transition period. It's a reactive technology one too. Wise. Yeah, yeah. like the you know over. The past 20 years has been very strange. Mm-hmm. I don't know about for you guys, but like <laughs> things are changing at a very rapid pace. And we're in, you know, lots of things have changed. Journalism has changed. Newspapers right. have changed. Publishing has changed. Movies have changed. And I think if we wait another 20, 30 years, 
hopefully we'll, we'll all still be around in 20, 30 years. We'll, we'll be old, but we'll, we'll be able to look back on this period of time and really see the pattern emerging and it'll, it'll go somewhere. Yeah. Things yeah. always do. I talked a couple of weeks ago about um, how the VOD markets are the ones that I consider to be the most perplexing right now, because um, whereas like there's a transparency that happens in theatricals and transparency in video, like when you're selling DVDs, you report how many DVDs you've sold or how many ticket sales you've had. There is no transparency in VOD. So like Amazon will not tell you how many times something has been watched and same thing with Netflix or Hulu. And it makes it so confusing because like something like ABCs of death technically showed up as like a box office failure, but they ordered a second one and said that it did great on VOD, but who's to know. So, um, yeah, I'm anxious to see where VOD goes. Are you doing VOD yet or still kind of in preliminary stages? Um, we're doing it in the UK. I don't know here. Don't have distribution here. How does it work here? Do you get an Ameri- Do you have an American agent who? I have no idea. Okay. Oh, you mean for the, sales? For Jim? sales, we here. have a okay. we have sales agents. And would when, when you're uh, going to play it somewhere like Etheria, are you going to be trying to get people to that screen? Yeah, with that yeah. definitely. Okay, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. yeah, and that'll be a great crowd to play it in mm-hmm. front of because yeah. it's like playing on your home crowd. That's cool. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm hoping. If you're listening to this, you should come to this event. <laughs> <laughs> everyone, everyone should come to this event. Uh, Everybody should come see this this awesome new movie. Yes, that they're not going to see anywhere else. Right? I mean, you cannot see this film. It's not playing in another theater right now anywhere in the U.S. So you have to come see it. And unrate this is the version with cutting, right? Yeah, yeah the one that's going to start a massive wave of suicide. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah, look look at Denise Papers the day after. I committed mm. suicide after I saw it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and survived. She showed us how. Yeah. So. I can't and, believe we're making light of this. <laughs> 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 so it's a very serious thing. And my question for Heidi. Mm-hmm. Hi. Hi. <laughs> uh, no, I'm just curious because obviously you've you've delved in all different uh, aspects of of horror entertainment, whether it be writing and acting and, and stuff like that. But now at these film festivals, you seem to be more of an advocate for helping people find these type of movies. So you personally, are, are you still interested in doing things like acting or making your own films or, or are you more comfortable in this position to advocate other people's films? Um, that's a really good question. Yeah. I, you know, I would. Thank you. Congratulations, <laughs> Rob. I, uh, Touché, Rob. Touché. I, I, I too um, am of the school of thought that I'm not a great actress Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not really like my calling in life is it's just, you know, it's not going to happen. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, um, but I, I do like being in stuff. I get a really big kick out of certain kinds of performance. Like I like comedy stuff a lot. Um, so I, when, when my, my best friend, Stacey Ponder lived here, we used to shoot a lot of really silly little videos and put them on the internet and we had a blast doing that. And I, I love doing stuff like that. So, mm-hmm. you know, I would, I will always love, you know, being an asshole on camera. That will always be my thing. I love it. Um, and yeah, I would love to, I actually, I have a short film I would love to make. I just don't have $5,000. I to want make to it. make that short film too. Yeah. It's pretty, it's an amazing oh, script. It's right. good. And, uh, I would love to make it. I just literally have no fucking money. And I, I don't want to do like a Kickstarter because, I am so sick of everybody's Kickstarter. High five. Like, don't fucking send me your Kickstarter. I will not contribute. I don't fucking care. And so I'm not going to ask anyone to contribute to mine because that would make me a giant hypocrite. So, um, you know, we'll see. if Eventually I'd like to do that. But, yeah, for right now, I mean, honestly, like, I, I've been doing a lot of writing. Um, I just wrote this chapter in a book called celluloid ceiling women directors breaking through and it's like this this book put together by gabrielle kelly who's an nyu professor and it's all about women directors and i got to write a chapter that was really great and i have a book that that i am need to finish um on women directors of horror films so Mm -hmm. that's kind of what i think i really want to focus on and you um, know somebody I was raving about last week was uh, I finally saw The Being last week. Oh, yeah. And for oh, me, yes. it trumped I asked a Blood Diner by like, yeah. like, I love Blood Diner, but The Being blew me away. I, was, I thought it was so fun. Like, I, I just thought it, it was made by someone who, re- like with Blood Diner, I wasn't sure. When I watched Blood Diner, I was like, I don't know if the person who made this knows how to make a movie. I can't quite tell. I love it, but I can't tell if it's a, disa- a train wreck. But when I saw The Being, I realized, no, it's not. It's, it's somebody who's really got great comic timing. Yeah. And it's, it's genuinely fun. I loved did it. Did you watch that because of the trivia question? No. I, I watched it because um, it was on a double feature with The Dark, which oh, I'd been tracking nice. down. 
Um, and I really did. I thought it was great. And so we, yeah, I know a long time ago we tried to get in touch with Jackie Young, but you, oh, yeah, 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 you yeah. had the hookup for that. How, how did you know her? Was it through Viscera? I didn't know everybody. <laughs> <laughs> it was through my, actually through my old website, Pretty Scary. Oh, cool. um, I have a friend named Amanda who lives in Pittsburgh now, soon to live in Austin. And she's a TV, she is a great writer. She used to live in LA. Amanda Reyes. I don't know if you ever met oh, Amanda. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I know Amanda. Um, she introduced me to, to Jackie's movies and she ended up writing a little retrospective of Jackie for my old website, pretty scary. And we put it online and Jackie had done this weird thing where she, she made these movies. And then in the nineties, she sort of disappeared. Like she was doing stuff. Like she was doing other things. She just wasn't making like, like mainstream films. She was like, raising a family and she was working for like various organizations for like Asian women in film Mm. awareness and this and that. So she was nowhere to be found and she wasn't really on the internet. So all of a sudden out of the blue one day we got an email from, this was like 2006 or something like that. And it was Jackie. And she was like, Hey, I just wanted to say, I found this really cool thing. You guys wrote about me on your website and it was really cool. And it was really pleasant to, to find it. So thank you for writing it. And it was sort of jumpstarted like a friendship with her. Um, and yeah, and I mean, she's she's really awesome, and she has some really funny stories to tell about like the blood diner and the being. And um, a, a lot of times, I've noticed in LA, the the, the other people that made Blood Diner, um, Michael Sonia, he goes by Dookie Flyswatter, and um, Carl Crew. Oh yeah. Um, are the guys that will get like if if the new Beverly screening it, like those are the guys that get invited, and Jackie tends not to be invited to any of these screenings because there there's like this whole big story about how they all hate each other because of shit that went down on the on the set and stuff like that. So there's all these like really neat little backstories of everything and it's cool to get like everybody's little backstory because hmm. everybody's got But the other lead died, right? Like uh yes. the other lead died. Yeah, tried, right. yeah, yeah, that's that's right. Yeah. Nobody yeah. hated that guy. They all liked him. <laughs> right. but, yeah, well, that's easy. Yeah, I, actually, I thought it was, uh, I saw it at New Beverly not too long ago and thought it was suspicious that she yeah. wasn't there. Yeah, they're but, not friends. And they they all have different stories about, I mean, I, they should, you know, they should tell their own stories. But but but, but they, uh, Jackie made a different film mm-hmm. than the film that was originally written. And the writers think that it would have been better if it hadn't been changed. And Jackie thinks that it's much better the way it is now. Mm-hmm. Well, she obviously that's, wins because of yeah. how it's remembered. You know? That's yeah. that's sort of the essence of the conflict. The story, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And tell tell her your your hashtag that you came up with last week. Oh yeah, King uh, Kong is king. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kong is king. I was all about it after seeing the being. I'm like Kong is king. Is yeah. that? No, it really. But it, it is funny because I think that that thing that gets popular with oh it's so bad it's good. I wasn't sure with Blood Diner because it's really funny, but there's also scenes that seem unintentionally like poor, maybe poorly constructed. Mm-hmm. Thing. But then when I watched The Being, I, I didn't have to question it. It was just like, no, this is a person who's just actually really funny. Yeah. And she, no, she, and she does really strange. She has a strange style. She also made a couple of comedies. Know. Right. I've heard that. Night um, Patrol or something? Night Patrol. I seen that uh, and she, which she, she made them both with the unknown comic. Um, Night Patrol is the, the big one mm. that got. I, she made that before she made Blood Diner, but after she made The Being. The Being actually. Almost yeah, like, it was ruined a shelf, her career. Right, yeah, shell for a long time. Yeah, she was like super young when she made that. She was like twenty three or twenty two, hmm. um, and she was like, "That's it, my my career is over." And then she ended up making Night Patrol, which was a huge hit in like nineteen eighty five. So what's the um? And this is more hot button type topic. But what's the percentage of females uh, in woman in say the position of directing, cinematographer, and producing in Hollywood? Not just horror, because it, I have a skewed view because. Whenever I read things online, oh, where it's about misrepresentation, I, it's skewered because I'm always hanging out with these people in yeah. this small community of horror fans who literally t- seems almost 50 50 in the group I hang out with, yeah. which is nowhere near yeah. realistic at all, you know? And so, what is, I, I, A, I'm interested in like the reality of that number, and B, what you think that needs to happen to kind of make that something that is perceivable that can change, can even occur in that. There are actual like numbers you can easily look uh, up. I don't want to say I mean, I, I because I don't, I don't want to get, I'm not going to get them exactly right if I say, but um, I think it's somewhere around 16% of right, women so really making um, around 16% of women in power positions. And, and by power positions, they mean producer, director, um, writer, um, making mainstream Hollywood theatrical releases. 
And this is out of like a sampling of like 500 films. So that I I actually just wrote an article for Movie Maker magazine, the summer issue on cinematographers and the idea that there's this concept that we were talking about cinematographers earlier, yours, this idea that there really just aren't that many women cinematographers. Um, if you ask somebody in Hollywood, they'll say they, there just aren't that many. I haven't come across that many. And you'll notice if you look at these numbers, about 2% of women cinematographers make big budget Hollywood films. If you look at the independent world, it is much closer to 50-50 yeah. because I can make a movie and not get paid for it and still have still be the director. Therefore, I'm a director, right? And I can, also, I can, so that, that's kind of how the independent world works. It's like the money isn't pulling everybody's strings. But when the money is pulling the strings, the women don't get the job. And it was the shift to uh, digital, which truly did become a little more democratic in the yeah. sense that uh, I think a, a large part of how Hollywood – was always stayed so male in a sense is that you always worked your way up departments. Mm -hmm. And so these people wouldn't just wouldn't hire anyone and you'd work your way up. So once that is eradicated and it's just getting a camera and learning a skill, it probably becomes a very different field. You know? Yeah. And I, I think it is also a generational thing. I think right. the, the generation on up there um, is a lot more sexist than the generation right. we are and the generation below us. That's just the way it is. Um, my parents are a lot more racist than I am. I mean, that's just kind of the way the world works, right? So um, I think we see people our age making movies, and it's not weird to us to see women doing stuff, but it is weird to some guy who's 68. It's weird to him. Right. He does. People hire their friends. Dudes who are 68 don't have girlfriends who are their friends. They just don't. They've never been friends with women. It's not something they do. They've, they're only... Gonna Except hire. Roger Corman, who was who Ro was really for a period was yeah. really giving a lot of people a chance. And Roger is an interesting guy. Like that, that is really uh, to me. The slumber party massacre film starting there. Well, yeah, I mean, Ro Roger started hiring women when nobody else would hire women, yeah. and it's not that Roger's like such an. I mean, uh, it's not God like bless him. Yeah. And yeah, it's not like he's such an awesome guy that he was like, I really want to give women a chance. He was <laughs> just like, you, you'll work yeah. for cheap. Do it. He didn't, yeah. he didn't find care who you know, are. I don't know he doesn't this, care if you're I'm talented if or not. Julie had anything to do. Uh, Julie Corman is. I have no idea if she had anything to do with the hiring of people. But I doubt it. Yeah. I mean, I'm not. I don't know. I mean, I'm not Julie. Yeah. But my. I think she does now, but I don't. Yeah. think yeah, she, well, back she's at the time, yeah, I don't think now. she had as much. Yeah. I think it was much. I think he him. he is. I think he gen was genuinely the least sexist person around because he genuinely did not give a fuck right. what, whether you were male or female. He didn't give a fuck. All he cared about was whether you could do it and could you do it on time, mm -hmm. could you do it the way he wanted, um, which is pretty cool. I yeah. mean, Which is really actually how it should be. It shouldn't yeah. be a bias either way. Yeah, which he was, is just, hard he was to, an asshole you know. to everybody. Right. Yeah. You know, he didn't care. <laughs> um, so, but but what can we do to, to change this? I mean, honestly, um, I think... Hollywood is filled with people who want to make a lot of money and they're never going to change something if it works for them because that's not what rich people do. They keep things the way they are because they want to get as rich as possible. And I think there are writers and directors and people that have creative vision and that bring a lot to it. But ultimately, it's a business. People want to make money and they don't care. So the answer is I don't know. Yeah. yeah, but you're doing something. And that's, I <laughs> yeah. think that's the point. You're I mean, saying was, what I'm, was what I'm doing going to make a difference? Probably not. But at the very least, I'm part of a discussion. And mm -hmm. I think that is important. I think I, what you have now that you didn't have 10 years ago, 15 years ago, is people talking about it. You have people yeah. posting their infographics on various blogs, like an outrage about how there's there's, news about that every day. Yeah. Yeah. And, so it's, and it doesn't it's something change. people are talking Still. about people. And there are people who are angry about it. And that means that we're starting the conversation and that's how things change. And it's annoying being, well, it's not, I don't want to say annoying, but like, I know I do at least two interviews a month on what it's like to be a quote female in horror. Oh, God. And I know, and you guys get it too. I know. Um, and it's reached the point now where I'm like, could you interview me about something else? I mean, like I got a lot of cool shit going on. Yeah. I, I not just boobs. But it's like Catherine Bigelow's but, interviews always impress me because she just says, look, I'm not a woman female. Like I'm just a filmmaker. Yeah. I don't, I don't need that moniker. I, I just yeah. am making movies and put me in the same league as everyone else. And I, I think that is a very, I mean, I don't think everyone can necessarily have that, say it just that straight. She's in a position where she can really claim that. And I think it's cool. Yeah. Gail Ann Hurd, obviously, yeah. is another person who's really been around for a long yeah. time and yeah. writes her own checks now. But I, mean, I, think, I mean, I think Catherine Bigelow has a good point. I yeah. think it's, it, you know, when you call a woman a woman director, are you 
actually putting her in a ghetto and making her is it a hand you know is it good to be the best woman director or is it better to be the best director well and the same thing has happened with different ethnicities forever like exactly. oh black cinema spike lee's a black director he's a good black director yeah, yeah. not just I a mean, great filmmaker but at the same you know, time it's... at the same time if you have very few black directors it's probably good to right. talk about yeah. them when they're there yeah. so but it's so it's a weird thing it's like yes yeah, i mean i feel very conflicted about it every day that's why i said i didn't want to call it annoying because at the same I, one point of me is like i'm so sick of doing this interview god damn it i have more going on than just you know a vagina but at the same time i do think it's important that we keep paying yeah. attention to it and have a conversation about it so i keep doing the interviews yeah. so yeah. Well, yes. I, I just remember people, some people being a kind of split about woman and horror month. I remember that oh, yeah, yeah. that some people are like, hey, we don't want to celebrate that as a special thing for month. And other and other parts of you go, well, what's wrong with that? That seems like something. Yeah, valid, I mean, I know? think that's what the issue was, is some people felt like it's like you're pointing something out that mm-hmm. we should be trying to eliminating rather than draw attention to. And other people like myself, for the most part, believe it's something that you need to draw attention to to fix. But I, I don't know if there's a, I don't know what the right answer is. You know, I just I think. I think both answers are right. I think it's if you are against women in horror month because you think it, you know, is bad for women, that's a good thing. Yeah. Because that means you care about equality. And if you're for it because you think it helps women, that's good too. But there's still every single time there's that discussion online, you look at the comments and there's still yeah, yeah. comments of people going, well, women don't know horror and there shouldn't be. It's every single time. I mean, it that still is, brings it's up weird. the same kind of uh, yeah. sexist attitude. Yeah. But the, I mean... Those people are idiots, though, right? I mean, you know. Yeah, I got asked a couple of weeks ago in an interview, um, do fans treat you differently? And I wanted oh, to God. respond with kind of only the the bad ones. And I don't want to say fans are ever bad, but I definitely at conventions will have fans that come up to me and will see me at the booth and say, you work for Fangoria? And I say, yeah, for a long time. I've been here a while. And then they'll immediately quiz me. Have you seen Argento, oh. Suspiria? And they don't do that to my male counterparts. I had, yeah, I, I went to a festival and I <clears throat> I remember interviewing this this um, pretty well-known genre actor. And he uh, he's talking to someone later on. And, and for some reason, I see him point at me and he's like, there's no way that woman works for Fangoria. <laughs> and he really, like, he really meant it as in, mm-hmm. uh, there's no way she knows her shit. It's it's weird, and I've never seen the quizzing that I get at conventions happen to Dave or Elric or Rob or anybody else who's standing at the Fango booth. But then the funny thing is that the second you can show them that you I know, know your stuff, you're like, quiz me. oh my God, you're the best person in the yeah, world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I, I got a little bit of that at Horror Trivia. Where yeah. <laughs> people at the end of it were like, Axel, I'm so impressed with you. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's because I'm a girl, right? Yeah. <laughs> You I also, I mean, no one they mentioned. You love. also wrote a book <laughs> yes. about horror, oh, that's yeah. Right. Yeah, so yeah. which I still haven't read. I finally had it. <laughs> oh, I've never don't. had a copy. Okay, well, well, yeah, it, it's so weird then. because I, it, it's it's about the last, well, not ten years, but like the 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 wave of horror movies that started around two thousand mm-hmm. up until I think the book came out in two thousand seven, two thousand eight. Oh, okay, so it's and that's curious. around the time that I started hanging out with a lot of people whose films were reviewed in the book. Oh. and I've always <laughs> thought I'd been pretty mild. And now I go back and I'm, I'm like, oh my God, I've just met this guy. And what you're did I out Oh, <laughs> oh <laughs> ouch, ouch. Oh, I met her. Uh, I got to make sure that he yeah, never happens. reads this. <laughs> That's not, what wow. was the name of the book? It's, it's called It Lives Again. Okay, I need to read Barra's copy and I will read it anyway. Yeah, do they have it at Dark Dells? I can't uh, remember. They used to. I don't know. This okay, because it, it got it got. It's a, pretty old now. It got a UK release, but it, did it get released officially in the US? Um, It was the same company. I don't right. know. Yeah. It was I, think, I think I, I mean, I bought it. Yeah, yeah off it of should Amazon. be too. That means it's, I don't think it was shipped from the UK. Right? But they definitely used to have it at Dark Dell. Yeah. Well, you, you shouldn't have problems finding it. On I remember we I did guess. the signing and yes. a couple of our friends were like, thanks for signed. mentioning my film, but I wish you'd liked it. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> if they were oh. your real friends, it wouldn't bother them. So there. <laughs> should we delve just as like a quickie as we kind of are kind of finishing into our favorite genre because you made a film about love. <laughs> it's a, it's really, it's you a made romance. A love story. Uh, our favorite romance is we wanted to differentiate it from our sex episode because we've only we did a pretty in depth look at <laughs> sex and horror, which and there is a big difference between romance because and I was, weirdly enough, when I was looking at it, a lot of the best horror films, like the the top 
tier of what people think of the chapter have no romance in them whatsoever. Mm-hmm. They don't even have, they, they might have a boyfriend, girlfriend character, but there's nothing there. Like whether it's Chainsaw Massacre, Exorcist, whatever. Yeah. It, I was kind of surprised when I was just flicking through going, yeah. oh, okay, because I always think it is a key component of a horror film. You right. know? Well, I think it either needs to be about that relationship and then the whole film is about that. Like The Fly is mm-hmm. the best yeah. example yeah, I can really think is. of. Yeah. It's, um, it's a date movie, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Or it needs to a, not have superb, any of it. Uh, the chemistry of the actors, because if you look through Cronenberg's work, he's never been able to make anything with that kind of warmth. Mm-hmm. He's an incredibly cool uh, filmmaker from Dead Ringers, which has a romance, which is just cold and disgusting, uh, to Crash. And yet that one film, and I think it's 100% the chemistry of those two actors just yeah. emerging and from... Their, and maybe their know, real life romance of course, that could be contributed well, to it. You know, but, the brood's kind of a love movie. <laughs> yeah, he's better at that, at the reverse, right? <laughs> no, I think most vampire films have right. at their core a love story. Right. Like even Dracula, of mm-hmm. course. Um, yeah, but, Bram Stoker's but I, I was thinking, I find very romantic. Yeah, and I was, but I was thinking The Lost Boys. Yeah, yeah Fright Night. I put that on my list. Um, um, yeah, Let the Right One In, yeah. even. Near Dark. Even. Near, dark is, near Dark. And Near Dark, when you know, it's by Catherine Bigelow, but you, you all, people always say, oh, can you tell a woman or a man directed a film? There's always that thing, oh, I don't think you can tell a difference. I'll tell you, the one scene in that where there's something going on with the power play, it's where I think she lassoes the guy. No, he lassoes her, but yeah. then she pulls him in and it's a very fun little quick gender reversal of what you're expecting in that moment and it's little moments like that where you get little hints that there's something else going on it could be the writer you know which is Eric Red I doubt it <laughs> just a guess just you a hear guess. that Eric <laughs> um yeah. But yes. And also, well, they also go back to the gothic roots of all, yeah. and, and Wuthering mm-hmm. Heights is incredibly romantic. I, I've never seen anything that got me more like, oh, my heart uh, flutter, if you will. Uh, and so I think, uh, obviously, all the Dracula, the mummy is very romantic. Well, I remember yeah. thinking when I was writing Soulmate, and again, not being a love story, but being this kind of relationship kind of thing. Um, so, uh, this sounds bad. Um yeah, don't want to call it a relationship movie, but you know, <laughs> something that has it's two, just two people, people connecting it's two somehow. People talking about the relationship for an hour and a <laughs> half. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's so, great. So I, I remember. Th- film. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and that's no, so Swanberg plays the dead guy. Yeah, yeah. And he plays <laughs> I remember thinking all the classical monsters from the mummy, Dracula, every yeah. single one of yeah. them, the creature from the Black Lagoon, they all have this kind of love interest that ends up being their demise at oh, the yeah. end. King Kong. And the ghost, yeah. to yeah. me, seemed to be the one that didn't have that. So now it's kind of in my phone. I always think, um, and he's kind of like the universal monsters, except later, uh, the abominable Dr. Fives to me is like one of the most romantic humans on Earth. Oh, yeah, Like yes. everything is coming from love. Like, yeah. which is, it's, it's a pretty, it seems like a pretty strong motivation in horror films. Yeah. Especially revenge motivated horror films it's usually for the loss of mm-hmm. that person which i think is interesting may uh, is a great one uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. that's pretty great yeah yeah well, my my ha- con- i have my contra yeah habits Habit. really i think habits one of the best about like what you're saying two people connecting who feel like real and it's not really about the horror elements while you're watching it it's only kind of later that they mm-hmm. catch up to that film i guess it's ca- it's capturing chemistry yeah i think exactly. that's the big difference where exactly. you know because two people could be a couple in a movie but if there's some kind of chemistry when you're watching it where you're like oh i see it between mm-hmm. them you know something's happening but uh, my controversial one, which is the uh, is Shelley Duvall involved, because I'm walking. <laughs> if she, he has this weird no, no, fetish no. for Shelley Duvall. It's, I, you know, it's mo- and, and I'm sure you all you're all gonna agree with me. But the 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 one that I don't think is a love story at all, or okay. that's that's confused in the public eye as a love story, is Bride of Frankenstein. Right. Because growing up, before I had seen it, I mean, I you know I'd caught the Universal monster movies, Wolfman, Creature, and the first Frankenstein, but I didn't see Bride of Frankenstein until much later on. But the way it's kind of, um, you know, marketed, so to speak, you know, T-shirts and designs and stuff about it's, you know, it's it's kind of used as a uh, to be synonymous with love. You know, it's like if mm-hmm. you're kind of a weird horror kid, you're going to get a photo of the bride mm-hmm. and Frankenstein together. But then I sat and watched the movie and it's she's like, in it for like five seconds. she's in it for five seconds yeah. and rejects him mm-hmm. immediately. So I'm like, yeah. and then he just kills them both. Like he did a yeah. sorry spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, to you me, had a century kind of, to watch it. Do you know what I mean? It's like the movie is the name of the movie and kind of the imagery surrounding it. It, it makes people think, oh, they're like the perfect horror mm-hmm. couple. Yeah. And also maybe, maybe actually it's the monsters. The fact that people grew up on the monsters yeah. could, could be, kind of could be, like yeah. that imagery of like, oh, I see, you know, have you seen mad love? 
Mad Love's much closer. That's the one with Peter Lorre and he's bald and he's basically trying to kind of build the oh, perfect yeah, yeah, woman, yeah, yeah. like a Pygmalion story. And it's really, but it's, it's similar. You would, on the surface, it looks like a love story, but it's the opposite. It's about somebody forcing, creating someone, forcing them to love someone, which right. is the opposite of love, you know? Yeah. Uh, now there's some good, you know, I think the chemistry in the birds is great. I think the chemistry, uh, Tippi Hedren's a really, oh, yeah, I find her to be a really progressive, like sexy character because she's just, she's following She's after the guy, like she comes to the bay and she's drawn and she's like getting in his weird business with his weird overprotective mother and yeah, stuff. Yeah. And I just find her to be a really, <laughs> I find their chemistry when they're on screen together. It's fun. It's, it's, it's a fun palpable, little, yeah. uh, you yeah. know. And American culture. Werewolf in London, I think that, yeah. I think that's a really beautiful, I think it's very, the ending of that film is, is very sad. You know, it feels, uh, it's a funny film and scarce here film, but it also has that element, which is nice. There's some weird ones. Like there's weird ones that are kind of like, uh, I, I view things like Don't Look Now as the almost like the end of romances, you know, like mm -hmm. even because it's about kind of that part of their life is more or less behind them. And you're now dealing with the pain of trying to pull together. for, But that one brief moment where they connect, even though that's a, we talked about in the sex episode, it's much more about romance and, mm. and need and, and longing and stuff. But the one, another one, Donald Sutherland, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, mm -hmm. because I think what's so interesting about that is it's a married person, uh, Brooke Adams, and she's with somebody else. And mm -hmm. only through this, thing that's happening around them are this are these other two people who actually had feelings those feelings finally get to kind of emerge and they briefly get to be together before they're pod people um mm -hmm. but it's i find that quite sad i think it's really effective when the relationships are complicated when they're not just oh then it's my girlfriend and that's our roommate when there's some conflict kind well, of speaking of uh brick adams uh ah, Cronenberg's the dead zone yeah you know, so good. yeah you're right a that... few times that it's like and we've said it we've said it before yeah. it was kind of his I think he needed to make that movie to get to the fly, yeah. you know, in yeah. terms of getting to that relationship, mm -hmm. um, because it's, it's the same scenario. You know, he has this great love, uh, Christopher Walken's character and then loses her and just can't get her back. But you could, it's the last time that Christopher Walken <laughs> was a human before. Yeah. 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 The last time he was human Boom. and showed emotion yeah. before yeah. he became kind of the quirky, yeah, you know, like, yeah. character actor, yeah. Yeah. you know, and, I, and to an extent <laughs> reanimator, I know you mentioned it before. Mm -hmm. I kind of think that's a fun one. I, I mean, it's more, it's more prominent with the ending leading into Bride yeah, of Reanimator, kind of yeah. like the obsession that you don't want to lose somebody yeah. that you love. Uh, but it's still a cute kind of... But the concept thing. itself is very romantic. The I, Just the idea of something to stop death. Yes. The death is like the thing that cemetery. ends romance, right? And what's that? Pet cemetery. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. It's true. Yeah, the love of... You know, the, it starts with the child, but yeah. Yeah. I yeah, mean, no, that's it's powerful it's, too. It's interesting. I don't know. Any other great romances? I wrote down... Um, well, I had like the standard ones. I shouldn't call them standard, but I had down like Cemetery Man. Yeah, that was my top one. Fright Night and Lost Boys. But my three that were kind of more deep cutty, um, Chinese Ghost Story. Mm -hmm. I remember oh, that was on a lot of people's list. Yeah. I don't know that one. I, I love that one. I've never seen mm -hmm. that. No, it's it. about a guy who falls in love with a ghost who's being kept by a demon. Um, Did so they I'm, make like sequel? Like, was there another one in a remake tons. or something? They got yeah. remade and there's two sequels, I think. Okay. Really? Yeah, because I can't find the original because I keep the remake finding is the remake. Terrible. I own it. If Stay you away to, from it. Yeah. yeah, I want to see the original. Yeah. I really do. Yeah. I, I have the original if you want to take a look at it. But yeah, that one was like a true love story for me that I always thought was really sweet. Um, and then Red, White, and Blue, which is a weird one to put on the list, I know, but um, it's really? it's kind of a love story oh, for what, me. what he tries to do to at help the, her. Yeah, he tries yeah. to help her and he obviously, and, there, yeah. and she's having sex with all these guys, but with him, she just wants to lay next to him. And for me, it was like, what are the sweetest love stories it's I've like seen. me and my husband <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i mean and it's a fucking brutal film i yeah. mean it's a hard one to get through but you don't even realize it's a horror film until like the last 20 minutes but yeah it's for me that was a love story and then um my weird one on the list is called the insatiable and i think i've talked about it on the show before it's sean patrick flannery yeah vampire yeah vampire and he yeah. oh um, i've seen sees this. a vampire kill somebody and he becomes kind of obsessed with her and captures her, puts her in a cage. and puts her in a cage in his basement and he falls in love with her and for most of the movie you don't know if she has fallen in love with him too or if she's just tricking him so he'll let her out of the cage so she can eat him hmm. and so the whole movie most of it is just the two of them with her in the cage and him expressing his feelings and then her echoing back so but it's really it's a nice little mental movie i really enjoyed it vampire so. film that makes me think um the hunger mm -hmm. oh, oh yeah yeah the hunger and let the right one on both have elements of the romantic mm -hmm. even though let the right one is kind of weird because it's because they're kids it doesn't seem like a straight romance or something else there. but that, but but again that's that's you know Chemistry. that's the same as like a father and a child yeah. it's kind of you know it's a different it's a genuine love yeah 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 mm -hmm. you no, know i see those too and i think it's a beautiful story of 
kids falling in love. Not as romantic as Dead Girl. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, the most romantic movie I mean, yeah. it's just something about that the... Is, great great date romance. film. <laughs> great first date film. Is, I want to go around really quickly. Worst date movie you've ever seen. If it's horror, even better. Worst. But is there a movie that you just thought, like, this is the worst movie you could be with somebody in a theater watching? I'm just curious if mm. you have them. Because Dead Girl would be terrible. Dead Girl would just, like, be rough. I don't care who it is you're with. That would just be a <laughs> yeah. mood killer. I saw happiness. Maybe the irre- reason I'm bringing this up, I saw happiness oh, on the right. first and, and you it was wanted just, to laugh. You were oh, saying. I, I thought it was hilarious, <laughs> but I was in so much pain. I mean, I was I had had like these strong feelings and couldn't wait to get alone with this person. And watching happiness and when he's talking about like you know having sex with like his son's penis size and having sex drugging a boy, I was just like, oh, I was dying. What? Inside. Yeah, happiness. I've never seen oh, this my movie. God, it's one of the most bad shit. Yeah, movies. I was trying to think of personally. black comedy, black black comedy. But. Yeah, and, and not because of the content of the movie, but it's like the, the only thing I remember is there was a girl that I liked a lot back in high school and in my early college days, and we got along famously. And we went to, and we both loved Tim Burton movies, and we saw Planet of the Apes, his Planet uh, of the Apes, bummer. and I think it just bummed us both out yeah, so much it just sucks. <laughs> that we kind of hated each other after that. We're just like, I love that. Like, 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 literally, it was one of those like, like agreeing on everything. Like, oh yeah, that's so cute. Blah blah blah. And after we walked out of that movie, like we couldn't agree on a single thing. That's really so. <laughs> thanks, I'm Tim Burton. Him. Yeah. Thanks for your fucking Planet of the Apes. Yeah, that really relationship wow. could have been my, you know. But that's true. Like the movie itself will have this, the quality will rub off on the relationship. There's all these, all this chemistry going on between the movie and the viewer, but also the couple. It's, it's pretty cool. My favorite story, it's not even me. It's, it's my old manager that used to work at Amoeba was a huge David Lynch fan. And like, he'd religiously go see all his movies. Mulholland Drive came out. He saw it three nights in a row straight. Uh-huh. And he said that he started dating a girl and took her to Inland Empire. And they, <laughs> they literally, and, and he was, he was even there for Q and A. And it ended there. They, like after they left the movie, they they're like, yeah. "This is just not going to work." Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. Inland Empire, because yeah. they sat and watched Inland Empire. Together. That's funny. Yeah. Wow. So, so all, all three of you are completely oh. silent. So none of you had a bad movie experience. I will say something else, though, and it involves Axel. Yeah. Axel looked far less excited Axel, than all the guys. <laughs> Axel and I went together to the Museum of Death here oh, in Los right. Angeles. Yeah, been there, yeah. and that's a great date. Please. Yeah, the Black yeah. Dahlia photos are nothing better I've never, better for a date, I've I mean. never felt. I'm glad that I went with Axel, something I'm not romantically involved with because she's married and I didn't have a girlfriend at the time. But I, I was saying when we walked out because I felt, I felt a so happy to be alive and miserable at the same time yeah. that I'm like, my future girlfriend and your husband better appreciate that we did this on their behalf yeah. so that they didn't have to do it. I really think that's a relationship killer. I'm yeah. just, I'm sorry. Yeah. Really? Seeing dead people in horrible. I, I never want to go back there again. I would never take a date there how do you think neil would have reacted to that place? i have no idea i don't See? know i so i've welcome. noticed that guys tend to be much more um uh uncomfortable around actual death mm. and talk about death than than women somehow i have that conversation mm. with with Stuart gordon and his awesome wife carolyn where we start talking about things like we we both read stuff about i don't know experiments conducted on corpses or something and we start talking about it and i see Stuart start kind of squirming in his chair and it's like that and looking at neil and they're like this is gross because we have less years than you guys <laughs> <laughs> it's like we're ticking clocks constantly so well horror and, guys tend to be super sensitive that's what it is well, i do have to say i worked at a funeral home for many many years um kind of paid my way through college with that and i've definitely had a lot of well actually it's guys and girls creeped out by it so yeah. I, I can't. Yeah, horror people tend to be very sensitive. Oh yeah, very, they. T- I think yeah. the most. The most people who don't want to see blood. The most people in real life. Oh, I pass out when I yeah. the no, sight no, of blood. Oh, very my gosh, horrible. Yeah. I yeah. have big problems. Like if someone is bleeding or gets injured, I get so dizzy mm-hmm. from it, yeah. and I'm such a sympathy vomiter. I am so weak <laughs> when it comes to anyone else's like <laughs> medical problems. <laughs> I don't know. Childbirth cha- did, did did change me a little bit. I I was I didn't like seeing anything gory. Really? But I just remember looking for a flash frame of just like gore. Was your brain was your <laughs> like, brain telling you that she was dying? Yeah. Like, well, I mean, there's something in your body, and when you just see gore, not I'm not even on her body anymore, but like on a tray, <laughs> sitting next to the thing, and there's just stuff, and you yeah. don't know what it is, and your brain is almost broken at that point. But because it, luckily, because there's a positive emotional thing happening as well, it's able to. But if I had just been in the room, <laughs> some, some dude standing there, I probably would have dropped it. It's down. true. Horrific. Childbirth it's is pretty, not it's a pretty, pretty thing. Pretty it's really freaking horrific, and there is just stuff. Yeah, there's just uh, stuff. You just don't know where what it is. I forgot my, the from. most romantic, my absolute favorite romance, because I love them, and I hope there are a couple still in the world, and I know ex- they live in my homeland, dead alive. 
Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That couple is beautiful. That it's is set in the taquita. 50s. Everything about them. Your mother ate my dog. I mean, they're yeah, just that's so a, great. That's an know? awesome. And it's fun. And it's like Peter Jackson. It, it feels like the last truly like from the heart. It's very moment, fresh you know? and very innocent. Yeah. 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 I think setting it in the 50s. I mean, New Zealand, I always thought growing up was a little bit about 20 years behind most countries or like America. It's kind of caught up now. Since the internet, I think most countries have caught up. But setting it even further back feels just, it's just perfect. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I just, I just love that relationship. I can't remember the last shot of the film. I'm trying to think if it's of the couple. I imagine it probably is. Mm-hmm. I, I haven't seen it in a while. I'd love it's to see that a on a big screen. Yeah. yeah. Again. But, yeah, uh, no, I think that might great. be my yeah. favorite horror film. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's a lot. It's yeah. really so much yeah. fun. And you know he's being influenced just so much by, you know, Evil Dead and Reanimator yeah. mm-hmm. as to his film. You know, where is that guy now, man? I, I just, Peter Jackson, I would just kill for another film from him. I just want to point out that this is the first time that you you referred to it by its real title. Well, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Brain Usually dead. he's all like the brain dead purist. That's, that's all I did. Partly, like partly why I'm doing it is because I actually quite like that other movie, Brain Dead. Yeah, I quite like the weird <laughs> Bill Pullman, Bill Paxton. One, yeah. Uh, Harold and Maude. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just totally forgot his name. But uh, but yeah, no, it's 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 a fun one. But like, you know, like I uh, love Heavenly Creatures and I, I really think Frighteners is fun. But man, I just don't know if that if he can connect on an intimate level with a movie anymore. Reiner's just didn't, so big. didn't do it for me. Like I can't. Oh, but Combs is so fun. See, that's the, the one thing about that. Yeah, movie no, I he's can, great in everything. Yeah. I, I mean, I can watch him like yeah. on Deep Space Nine or, right. or or on Voyager or something, and he he's amazing. He makes it, it believable, yeah, yeah. and he's saying like the stupidest line the you've ever heard. He is, but he's amazing. Yeah, he yeah. can do anything. Yeah. So that's just him. Yeah, he is a good yeah. actor. But with Frighteners, I always love the scenes when it was just Michael J. Fox with his ghost. But as right. soon as it became like the weird woman being trailed by her boyfriend, husband mm. in the yeah, house, yeah. that's when but I was Dee kind Wallace of like, is always awesome. it disconnected I think she's a bit. Fine. No, the yeah. cast is great. Yeah. It's just something about the film I couldn't connect to. But it. after that, it was just like, you know, it, like I know his wife wanted to make Lovely Bones. Mm. And I feel like if she had directed it, it probably would have been a better movie because, she, I mean, I remember her. The problem with that is it's like it starts with like a brutal rape and murder. Mm-hmm. And then the movie, they gloss over the rape and murder. And you're like, yeah, but that's kind of the pain of that is the payoff of that book. The book's actually pretty, I thought it was pretty powerful. Mm. But when you gloss something like that over, how, what's the movie? Lynn Ramsey made Ratcatcher and we need to talk about Kevin was meant to direct it like right up until production. And then Peter Jackson was interested and went away. So yeah, movie making, man, movie making. Bummer. Yeah. But we're not going to end on a bummer because that's <laughs> yeah. not our style. So we got a theory coming up in two weeks and I'm psyched. I'm so psyched. Oh yeah. And Rebecca is, is going to be there doing the Q and a oh, cool. with Axel at the end of, of the screening of soulmate. Mm-hmm. Um, and at the end of the the shorts too, so yeah, yeah, so yeah. it should be a fun fun night. I'm yeah. kind of so. What, what's the scoop? It's uh, Saturday, July twelfth. Saturday, July twelfth. It starts at four o'clock in the afternoon with Soulmate. Yes, the that's first our thing. first screening. And after that, um, starting from six until about seven thirty eight, we're having a red carpet. Um, we're gonna get Axel out on the carpet and mm-hmm. make her look. You know. She like everybody stare at, at her. Make her um, you guys have to be there so we can get our traditional like red carpet threesome shot that yeah. we always yeah. do. Yeah. I'm not and going to this there's event. There's actually, there's, <laughs> I mean, I'm going to hit you up because there's one female filmmaker I'm dying to meet. Oh, yeah? Dying to oh, meet. Who is it? Who? Yeah. She may have directed one of my favorite superhero movies of all time. Oh, oh the character yeah. that we mentioned. Oh, Lexi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, you know, Lexi Alexander is going to be there. Yes. Um, her like, Punisher she's a good is the friend best one. She's good. Yeah, she's very. Can't wait to meet her. She kicks ass. Um. She's very excited about soccer right now. You can should message Wait, are her you about friends soccer? with Rachel Talalay? Because I've got yes. some bones to pick with Rachel. Oh, do you? I just earlier in the show, <laughs> she, I forgot to mention she directed Ghost in the Machine. Oh. Yes. That I watched this weekend. Yes. Um, okay. I did really like the flaming, um, what's the thing you dry your hands on at a bathroom? This so, makes sense. The air that, dryer? that was amazing. Of course, my, Mike likes it. Yeah, Mike loves it because Freddy's he likes too. Freddy's Dead too. <laughs> I just want to talk to her about the Tom Arnold Roseanne cameo. Oh. <laughs> I'm taking it to you all these yeah. years later. I have problems with it. Yeah. Let's get her on the show. Huh? Yeah. You like should. Freddy's she's dead. actually, she's directing um, some um, Doctor Who. Oh, cool. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But now I need to approach her about my theory because I told them my theory on Freddy's dead. She at the time had been doing a lot of sitcoms. She'd been directing a lot of television, these kind of, you know, three camera setup sitcoms. And then she started doing Freddy's dead. And you see that sitcom style bleeding through in Freddy's mm-hmm. dead. And I don't think it's cohesive for a lot of people, but if you think of it more as a sitcom with Freddie in it, it works. So if you try yeah. really hard to like it. I like it. <laughs> if you I don't know, just naturally enjoy the film. I know there's also some stuff about how gory she did want the film to be, but how she was 
not allowed to make it oh, quite. Weird. Yeah, because they they kept it. It's a PG thirteen, uh, and they wanted to keep it PG thirteen. So interesting. So you get an yeah. uh, ear device instead. Freddie's like, dead. That's not true. That's an R for sure. Are you sure? I yeah. Think it's a no. I can't think I'm of anything in there that justifies an R at all. But yeah, then again, I'm the girl the, who made the film that got cut out in UK. The but. ear device. I can't think it's of what still, the kills are in Freddy's Dead. The video game guy. Video game. One of them falls. The Wicked They're Witch of the West impersonation. There's the, 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 oh, yeah. That well, I, mean, I know they had a huge the problem with the one five. before it. I know five had a lot of cuts. But five had, like, the motorcycle that eats the guy. Am I in the right film? Mike Mendes just turned this off. Because yeah. <laughs> 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 he will always turn off our show. Anytime if we, we mention Freddy's dead. Freddy's dead, he's done oh, really? with the podcast. I'm he's like, I'm out. I'm curious. Talk well, amongst regardless. Yeah, regardless, we're done. So, red carpet. Yes. Red carpet and cocktail. Anybody who. It's our. Oh, it wow. is. Yeah, according I'm, to Wikipedia, it's I'm, my friend. I'm wrong. That's okay. Um, Today's standards, it's a PG-13 for sure. Um, but yeah. Uh, so okay, back to four o'clock soulmate. soulmate. I got lost. Six <laughs> o'clock um, red carpet and cocktail reception, um, and then we're gonna start the shorts at probably around seven thirty, eight o'clock, and we're having. Um, Julia Walter is one of our filmmakers. She's coming out from Germany for her short job interview. Um, Rebecca Thompson from Australia, who's, wow. yeah, she did a film called The Jelly Wrestler. Rose McGowan's going to be there for um, Dawn. And Gigi um, Guerrero, who directed a film called Dia de los Muertos, which I'm, I'm sure <laughs> I'm very makes you very happy. It. Yeah, no, um, it looks awesome. Which I'm sure is very different than anything you've written. <laughs> don't worry um yeah and and so those are our filmmakers that are going to be there and it's going to be a lot of fun and lexi alexander is uh going to come and get at what we call the inspiration award it's something that we did at viscera um a couple years in a row where we just we want to give an award to an established woman director who's done stuff that has inspired other women to go out and direct genre films mm-hmm. and lexi um as we know did punisher war zone that's her most famous comic book action Ralph film that she did um, she's she's Love also it. a really really down to earth crass kind of individual. She's a lot of fun, so right. excited to have her. Yeah, it's gonna be a good, good night. Yeah, it sounds fun. So uh, people can get tickets online, right? Yeah, people can get tickets um, on Fandango and through the Egyptian Theater website. So the important thing for Elric is what Watch is the finger. drink situation this year? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, because yeah. last year he got so angered so by the drink tickets that he and Dave during intermission we went, went across whiskey. the street and got Dude. shots and then came back. Yeah, You were not as angry about the drink situation as I was. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, th- this year, if you buy a ticket to the... There's two separate tickets. There's a ticket to the feature, and then there's the ticket to the shorts. And we've we've structured it so that if you buy a ticket to the shorts, you also get free drinks. If you don't want to buy a ticket to the shorts, it's cool. But then you buy drinks at you pay for them each at the uh, reception. So and it's we a think that's of fair. Like Seventy eight dollars, yeah. something like that. I mean, LA. honestly, it's you like know. eleven bucks, and right. you get like drinks. It's like, you know, it's a good deal. Do it. The people and listening in Nebraska are just like who. <laughs> I don't give a shit about the this goddamn tickets. event. God damn it. Yeah, would you, would yeah. this show travel? Uh, like, could this same lineup travel so people yes. not listening here? Yes, okay. the, it will travel. I know we're we're going to do a Boston screening in September, probably, cool. or, or possibly early October. Um, and we're planning a Vancouver screening um, sometime soon as well. So those are the two we have lined up, but we don't have exact dates yet. Cool. Um, well, yeah. like the Facebook page, because then, you know, I'm sure you can get information on screenings and the films themselves yeah and the, the website is etheria film night and etheria is you know e-t-h-e-r-i-a um like the planet that she-ra yes. came from uh and yeah etheria film night and and hopefully people come out and check it out and like the films and have a really good time yeah and look up soulmate even if it's not in your town yet because we don't know it how it's gonna soon. come out yeah it's gonna yeah. come out has it got a facebook page no it doesn't Okay. It should cool. though. I'm, I, do I people noticed actually that. like movie pages? Yeah. yeah, I think they do for the information. They like there might be updated photos and stuff. Well, like a big ass spider page. Yeah. You know, I found out like when it was going to VOD and when it was going to yeah. television, and I always made sure it's you know, like, I got it. Then, yeah, like you, if you use it almost like a newsletter. It feels yes, like it just be my Mendes. friends who were on Facebook. Yeah, Mike Mendes. Yeah. Yeah. Not that you're listening if you're anymore. Still listening, yeah. if you're but, congrats uh, for your congrats for the Saturday award, man. Friend of the show and uh, Claire Kramer, who is another podcaster on this network, yeah. is the star. Uh, I guess that is a wrap. Yes. yes. We have talked about many different topics. 
<laughs> this was fun. <laughs> Thank you, Heidi and yeah. Axel, for coming Thank down. Thank you for having Thank you. Us. Looking forward to uh, the festival. Yeah, looking forward awesome. to seeing you guys there. It's going to be fun. Yeah. We don't Everybody, know come next. see Soulmate. It's really, really good. I promise. Yeah, nice. we, we, we'll probably be here again soon, but we might need a summer break at some point. You know, a we'll, little beach episode. Maybe we'll do summer comedies, beach comedies. Ooh, that sounds okay. fun. There you go. Maybe. Maybe. Okay, <laughs> we'll see you guys soon. Thanks for joining. Bye. Bye-bye.